Welcome to the Good, the Bad, and the Weird podcast spotlights. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And today we have special returning guests, our good friends, Paul and Sophie of SP Film Viewers. Welcome in. Hello, thank you for having us again. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. I, I always like having you guys on. It's, uh, it's, it's good to hear opinions from across the pond. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't know if we've got... The, the, the opinions that you want to hear this time or what I'd say uh, this was um I, d- I don't like this when you said you wanted to recover this film I think it was something that I, I don't know if as much as jo- uh, Sophie loves like Japanese cinema whether it's something that we could like do a whole episode on and be like you're trying to already predict what I'm going to say you don't even know what I'm going to say yet <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, for those unfamiliar who are just p- tuning in, we're doing a uh, pregame to Folktober this year and we're doing Japanese movies. So I wanted you guys on because you guys were kind of the big inspiration. I started talking to Paul about <laughs> folk horror films. And so that kind of led us down a rabbit hole. And now it's like, well, now let's look what other countries have. And Japan has so much mythology and folklore outside mm-hmm. of their horror films. So we thought a pregame to it would be. The right thing to do and at the time i was i got pigeonholed into like anime adaptations of stuff or anime movies i actually i think it was you paul who suggested doing kurosawa's dreams i started thinking about it, it's like okay yeah there's a lot of elements and for for though we just now we didn't announce it we're doing akira kurosawa's dreams <laughs> yeah yeah no i think it was there was when you sort of we had the discussion about like folk law and stuff i think i think i said there was there was a little, little bit of elements of this and then looking back uh through the the, the vignettes in the, the the film it's kind of like those areas where there is more heavier than others but hopefully as we go through the discussion of things you might have more information as to whether there's there's more than meets the eye with uh your research or anything like that yeah definitely and before we dive into it do you want to introduce your guys yourselves and give tell us a little bit about what sp film viewers is about <laughs> yeah. yeah so sp film viewers is a movie re- review podcast where i generally get my wife sophie to look back at films that she's she's watching for the first time basically and giving her honest and sometimes brutal <laughs> opinions on those films so if you've got a classic uh sometimes that they, they, yeah be quite harsh ridiculing of um what they what your childhood is all about really but uh, <laughs> yeah but also we also do um like new films that i haven't even i haven't seen for the first time either mm-hmm. so that's kind of like of interesting sometimes because obviously i've no idea what i'm going for and there's some films i haven't seen for where maybe i should have as well so it's kind of filling in gaps for me as well so it's cool it keeps it a bit more interesting oh yeah no i still have to listen to your guys's uh most recent inglorious bastards episode but i finished alien romulus and <laughs> sophie was so not happy with that yeah. one. <laughs> i feel like i've been on my little pedestal this like month i don't know what's gone wrong with me i've been like on my little soapbox and <laughs> just like <laughs> preaching about everything that's wrong i feel like this is sometimes where it shows the difference within our relationship and it can kind of test us which is a good thing <laughs> But obviously, we're going to be coming into October, which is where we have our real battle of, <laughs> <laughs> of me hating everything. <laughs> so yeah, it keeps uh, it interesting. Yeah, definitely. And that's fine. Chris makes me watch a bunch of kids or kid based or kid related movies that I should have seen as well, and I sh- tend to shit all over them. <laughs> Somehow miss the entire like nostalgia 80s and 90s movies <laughs> <laughs> yeah because the, the, to be fair the time i would would have been aware of them i was living overseas and didn't have i don't think you would cable. have even liked them then no probably not <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so we are doing kurosawa's dreams uh just want to kind of go over the cast and crew real quick as well as some of the sources that i uh, listened to uh in preparation for this so as we mentioned, written and directed by Akira Kurosawa with, and I didn't know this, Godzilla's Ishiro Honda being uncredited in both writer-director for this. Dreams is, a, as Paul mentioned, it, it's a episodic anthology of dreams that Kurosawa had, uh, experience in his life, as well as the fear and anxieties he had for the future go, uh, going forward. It stars Akira Tarao, Mitsunori Isaki, and Tohihiko Nakao, Nakano as I. And I'll get into that just a little bit as we start going into it. 
And I do want to bring up kind of what people might be a little bit more familiar with by the names, because I know you say you bring, if you bring up people's names, sometimes they're like, OK, well, who's that? But uh-huh. Kurosawa and Honda, I don't think they particularly need any introductions. I mean, one created Godzilla, one's considered one of the greatest directors of all time. Terraro had previously been in Ran, as well as, and it's a little bit more obscure, the live-action adaptation of Kashrin. Isaki would later go on to be in Kurosawa's Rhapsody in August, as well as in Howl's Moving Castle. Uh-huh. Uh, and Nakano would only be in one more film in Kurosawa and Honda's Mada Dayo, which is the last of the both of those directors' movies which I still haven't been able to get a hold of because it was only released on Criterion's AK-20 or AK-100, and it's yeah. been out of print for forever. One day. Yeah. And I do have a couple sources for this episode. Commentary by film scholar Stephen Prince, as well as The Making of Dreams by director Nobuhiko Obayashi. You might find this interesting. That's the director of Haosu, which I know you guys have covered in the past, too. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's a weird documentary because it's, it's just kind of like it's just like showing them maybe an interview here and there, but not like fully in depth interviews, as well as like intersplicing like sketches and stuff with the actual footage, but done in like the style that House is done in. So like very it's very stylized for a documentary. Know. It was yes. a little strange. <laughs> yeah, as well as interviews with script <laughs> supervisor Turoyu Nagami and assistant director Takashi. Kozumi as well there are some parts I will reference the book of yokai by Michael uh, Dylan Foster and Japan Demonium illustrated by yokai encyclopedia of Toriyama Sekian translated and annotated by Hiroku Yoda and Matt Alt. I know that's a lot but there, there there's a lot <laughs> we put a lot of effort in trying to get some research for these next two months of stuff so and also it I find especially for like this one and a few of our others that we're going to be covering soon there's just too much that I don't understand. I can enjoy the movie, but like I'm definitely missing some if I don't do the extra work, which I know for some people sucks and like isn't the point of watching a movie, but I do enjoy that I at least now kind of know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and that's that's something with it too is it's it's not a very straightforward movie. It like we said it's episodic and each protagonist is that sing- is a single person. That's why they're listed as I in the category. Is they're the per- they're Akira Kurosawa having dreams, which mm-hmm. makes the movie a little bit autobiographical. Which I think that's where Stephen Prince's knowledge of the history of Kurosawa comes in heavily in m- making the film a little bit more accessible and understanding of like mm-hmm. how it's tied to Kurosawa directly. And also, I was very excited when Paul brought this up because. The last anthology you guys, at least the one last one I listened to that you guys reviewed, Quiedon. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. know Sophie and Sophie hated that one. <laughs> so and did my husband. <laughs> Don't worry, you're not alone. Paul, Paul wasn't <laughs> the biggest fan either. So I was very curious. So what, what are your guys' initial thoughts on Dreams before we start getting into it? So I'd only seen this film once prior to re-watching it on the second viewing, but I did quite enjoy what I saw and it still still did because I looking back on my letterbox review of it and that way I put that down as um an eight out of ten. Uh, yeah yeah well yeah sorry yeah, four four stars out of five rather for letterbox uh, star ratings but um, so yeah I was pretty positive on on that and weirdly this time I think I was, it was like I, I kind of like I don't know if it lost a bit of the impact maybe this time around but in some in some ways it's some of it held up so like can't get away from like how some of the visuals and how it was all kind of put together but i feel like the some some definitely f- segments felt shorter than others like i would like a bit more depth or more equal pacing throughout there's some some of them there was like okay well, this is dragging on a little bit <laughs> like, um, more more time dedicated to something else but um other than that yeah still still positive over to me yeah Yeah. (laughs) okay I think for me this is my first time watching it and I really liked the idea of a younger dreamscape I feel like I enjoyed those a lot more more imagination involved and it just feels magical there's the foxes at the beginning where I'm really intrigued and I'd want 100% more because it ends where you're like I don't understand what's happened and I want to understand why they 
get married on a rainy, sunny day. Like I, I would have happily gone down that path a lot longer. Mm. I think when you get older, the reality of anxiety, the <laughs> the worries and stress and kind of everyday life come into your dreams more so. And I think that's mm-hmm. what it's depicting. I'll be biased and do say there's one of them that I really didn't enjoy. <laughs> um, but it does mean that overall it wasn't a good whole piece because it makes you realize how you grow up in life, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that because there, there's quite a bit to it. And we'll, we'll go through it as or we'll get into it as like each segment because I have it set up that we're each we're going to talk about each dream and sequence. So that way we're just exploring as as the movie went through. And one thing I do want to note, I don't know if you either of you were aware, this is actually Kurosawa's first film since 1945. Oh, that, is that right? oh sorry. I thought it was... Sorry, not his first film. First film since 1945 that he wrote and directed himself. Mm. But he also he also wrote it after Dreams and or sorry ran and couldn't get the funding to it. And it took Spielberg and George Lucas to get the funding to even make this movie. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it's, obviously they were must have been like very well. I mean, Akira Kurosawa is a big inspiration for a lot of filmmakers, and obviously they had a big yeah. They want to help as best they could to get his. Is the, the dream of making the film dreams, I suppose, mm-hmm. into reality. Well, yeah, and I mean, Kurosawa went through some hardships too, because this is like the la- like he he wasn't able to get a lot of work after Ram, and then it took like this is like the last of I think they said three or four mm-hmm. of his last major films he ever made. Mm-hmm. I also think that like you can kind of tell like how he saw his career a little bit in his last couple of films. And I think this one's like a good example of like him kind of reflecting in a way of like his career and what he has done. And then like you can just kind of see like him slowing slowing the ball in a way that like his previous works I don't think did. And I don't know on your guys' side. Paul, I assume you're a little bit more familiar with Kurosawa. Sophie, are you familiar at all with <laughs> Kurosawa? <laughs> a long, long while ago we did on the first of our um, what we called birthday specials, we and that was in lockdown when um, we covered the Seven Samurai. I think that's it probably was a slog. <laughs> I think that's only that's Sophie's only uh, Kurosawa film she's watched. That, my first question was to Paul: How how long is this film, please? Because it's like, please don't tell me it's three hours long. <laughs> I can't. He's known for making big epics, but he, uh, yes. yeah, this wasn't. A, yeah. <laughs> I say if Kurosawa, if if Nico hands me Kurosawa, I have to dedicate a full afternoon. <laughs> well, it d- depends. We haven't gone into like his earlier works that don't really. Yeah, like, a little lighter. Yeah, because it, like even his last the the movie that he direct wrote and directed himself was The Men Who Tread on Tigers' Tales, and mm-hmm. it's just like this weird comedy of this troupe of performers. So it's. It's something completely different than what we know him for today. True. Yeah, he has evolved quite a bit. So getting into dreams, the first dream is sunshine through the rain. Um, as Sophie brought up, there's it's about a fo- kid who follows who finds a fox wedding. Mm-hmm. And I'll get into a little bit of that real quick. So Kitsune, that, that's, the t- that's the type of fox they are. Kitsune is the word for fox, but also the term for the yokai themselves. Not all foxes can transform and it actually appears in the illustrated demon hordes night parade ying volume one by sekian and that's important because in that volume there were no descriptions for most of the yokai depicted because that those first three it's like first three or four volumes were mainly commonly known yokai Mm. and the earliest of a kitsune appearing is in the nihon shoki which is the second oldest book of Japanese classic literature, which was finished around 720 and about a thousand years before Sekian's work himself. And also there, it appears in the 1712 Wakan Sansei Zoo, which is a more scientific approach to yokai. But the reason it's that the, the lore behind why this is the Fox wedding is because it's a paradoxical nature of the sun being out while it's still raining And it's either said they have it because of that paradoxical nature or because it's the fox's powers that causes the rain and sun to do that. And so that's that that, if you're not familiar, Kitsune are very much trickster spirits. And so they're they're 
nice to us when we're nice to them, but if we're if we harm them, they're malevolent to us. So there's that little mm. in between that we see a little bit when the boy does spy the foxes. I mean, the foxes here, I think, make the most sense for a general Western audience. We don't have like as strong a like connection with foxes being like demons or stricture spirits, but like they've been a symbol of like trickery. We've had them in our lores and like personified them very readily for thousands of years. And so, like, I think that's very easy to, like, comprehend. And then, I don't know about in England, but in the Midwest, we have, like, a bunch of sayings for, like, when it's raining and the sun is out. Some people call it, like, the devil's wedding. Some people say the angels are crying. Like, there's there's a lot of, like, I mean, they're all very Christian-based because it's Midwest. But, like, there's a lot of, like, stories that go along with, like, weather and, like, specifically odd bit weather. So, like, having those two combined, I think, made this one very, like, approachable for me when I was watching it. I was like, okay... I don't necessarily need to know all of the background stuff. I kind of like can get a sense of roughly what's happening minus the trickster part. Mm. What about you? Cause I know there are some tales of foxes from the UK. So I don't know if there's anything you guys are familiar <laughs> with on that end. I don't think we would say anything about if it rains or if it's, well, it's British weather. It, it can be sunny and rainy quite a bit <laughs> here. <laughs> so honestly, it might not be very rare for you guys. so it's not that often but obviously if there is a rainbow we do think there's a pot of gold at the end of it sometimes and there's a leprechaun (laughs) (laughs) i mean leprechauns do kind of fill that same like like role though as kitsune in a way like sure they're tiny strange men but you know if you leave (laughs) them alone you're never gonna have a problem and if you mess with them you get tricked you get fake gold or you get buried depending on who you are both have red hair too Sure, if you want to stretch it. <laughs> I am now imagining a little fox dressed up as a leprechaun, and it is quite... <laughs> I enjoy this greatly. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of any of the like, laws and stuff of with fox stories, I think it's just that the fact they are normally it's like cunning and trickstery, but like, like Roald Dahl's like, Fantastic Mr. Fox kind of thing, really, I think mm. of with with that really and um the mischievous aren't yeah, they yeah mm-hmm. they don't mean you any harm not necessarily no as long as i think it's as long as you do good yeah. by them then yeah. you'll be fine yeah i yeah. feel like in japan though a fox is lucky it can be classed as in some cases yeah i think they they do like there's like shrines and stuff to them don't they and that's seen as like gods in, in a certain way i think yeah and like some of the i think it's called inari shrines or something mm-hmm so I in ghost yeah in ghost of Tsushima the you follow the foxes to take you to these shrines yeah that's, mm-hmm. what, that's what I'm thinking of yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well and that's the thing too is so this this dream is based off Kurosawa's stories that his mother would tell him as a kid which if you think about like folklore you tell your kids these stories to keep them safe and prevent them from like wandering off and like I can see it where you think it's supposed to be sunny but it's actually rainy and you get out go get sick but this is where it also gets a little autobiograph, semi-autobiographical because mm-hmm. the house that he sees initially is based on the primary school or the one he went to, he lived at when he was in primary school in Tokyo. Hmm. And I think that's, that's, so that's another thing too with like the rainbow is it's this, you see it in quite a bit of mythology of like, there's all, there's something magical at the end of it or something important. Cause this, in the story, this is where the Kitsune are supposed to live. But like, if you look at there, there's a there's an anime that I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but it's called Mushishi. Yeah. And there's a whole arc, <laughs> there's a whole story and arc about this man trying to find the end of a rainbow, but the rainbow that he's actually looking for is the opposite. And th- th- I mean, there's actually now that you bring up the leprechaun, there there are a couple stories of a man going to the end of the there's rainbow. A, there's a lot of stories about you get to the end and you either get given fake money that just turns into dirt. Well, well, in Japanese folklore, there's yeah. like specifically he finds a tree at the end of the rainbow and there's a pot, of, there's a bag of gold buried underneath it or something along those lines. Yeah, I think most of the stories I know of leprechauns anyway don't end with you making a good deal of money. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, the the other thing with this, though, too, is I bring up Sophie's point of this being how we grow in age. From your guys' perspective, does this feel like it'd be something you'd have a kid watch? Because it is very much so that curious age of kids being 
interested in weird stuff happening around them. Do you mean just this seg- segment or the whole, whole th- the film entirely? This segment initially, just for like the a kid's perspective. If you were because mm. with anthologies, mm. I feel you can like break it up for kids as they yeah. understand it. Specifically, the first two I think <laughs> would be more kids based, but yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. I feel like if we had a child, I would be happy for them to put it on. I think the first one as well with the foxes, we were saying it's a little bit like, what's the game we play? Well, we don't play when you're little. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's it's almost like, I don't know if you guys have played it, it's like a cross between what we call musical chairs where the music's playing and then when the music stops, you stop moving. Yeah. Um, And then you go and sit down on a chair and then the one who doesn't get to the chair is out and then it keeps going until someone is on the last chair. Um, But also a, a this this I don't know what the actual name of it is called, but there's a game where we played in the, the playground called like What's the Time, Mr. Wolf, and you you so you someone would turn the back to them, and then they turn around, and you as you're creeping towards them to tap them on the shoulder and run away, then you have to freeze, like because that's what they're kind of doing as they're doing that mm-hmm. sort of like mm-hmm. wedding ceremony. They're kind of like moving along, and then it's like music stops for a moment, and they kind of like freeze, and then when the music it feels like when the music continues, that's what's going on. I'd, but uh, I think we call that red light, green light here. Ah, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying, we definitely have a version of what time is it, Mr. Wolf, but there's a lot more talking involved in that one. At oh. least the one that I played. Granted, I went to a weird small school where we were like obsessed with pioneer times. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And well, and so I'm glad you brought that up too, because that per, the performance of the foxes is heavily inspired by no theater traditions. And that's how a lot of the performances are, I think, up until the nuclear one. Mm-hmm. So like the first half is very steeped in tradition. And I think that's... It feels like a stage play in a way. Well, in a way, it's not just Kurosawa's changing perspectives or his changes in his life. It's also becomes slightly historical in its context of This is the old Japan that people remember of you lived in this childhood, like nice looking house, but like you were connected with nature. You, there was still wonder to the world. There wasn't this fear of upcoming disasters. Yeah. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of people have that idealization of youth and childhood and times gone. So like styling it this way, even if you remove Kurosawa's like, self-insertion to like a lot of the characters and like the ideas and things like I still think it's very relatable to a lot of people to have this like dreamlike or play-like version of what your childhood was like because I'm sure if you like you, you like ask your parents you're like oh yeah I remember this great time your parents are like yeah that's not how that happened at all I'm glad you enjoyed it <laughs> but the rest of the family had a very different experience yeah no yeah that's true so I actually kind of curious is we've talked about like childhood movies on our show quite a bit. It's true. Childhood. I do force you to watch the youth regularly. Yeah. What would be like a UK or British Paddington? You've watched them. No, Paddington. (laughs) I'm talking about like when they were kids because we're kind of about the same age. So true. True. (laughs) What kind of child movies did we watch when we were younger? Or TV shows? You mean? TV shows or stories, just because I, I know we had, uh, what was that rabbit one? Oh, no, I, I think I might have it too, because I mean, Beatrix Potter is That's very hilarious. British. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, 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 we had like Peter, yeah, Peter Rabbit. But like, we, like the there was a TV program, and I, I would say you guys probably have it more than we do. There was like, PBS ran the like TV special short, like, watercolor animation one for ages, mm-hmm. yeah. and like, yeah. So a lot of us saw it. I think I'm the only one who has a video copy of it because it was just on like TV. But like a lot of us, that was like our big introduction to Peter Rabbit. And like that was really popular when we were kids. Winnie the Pooh was hugely popular too. I was going to say Winnie the Pooh. That mm-hmm. was like my first kind of impression mm-hmm. when you were going on about, I think that would be one yeah. that I was. I'd say similar as well. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of definitely a lot of people yeah. like that was their first movie was like the Winnie the Pooh movies. Because it's like you can start that at any age. There's no, you don't even need concepts. You don't need thought to watch Winnie the Pooh. You just can have shapes and colors. <laughs> and you've got Winnie the Pooh, so like, why would you complain? <laughs> it's always the cutest character. Well, and I think also some of it has to do with like with marketing too, right? Like if you're buying mm-hmm. children's stuff, like right now everything's at least for us is bluey themed because that's the big TV show right now. When mm-hmm. we were little, like. Thomas the Tank Engine and 
like Winnie the Pooh was like it was on everything it was on your bedding it was on pacifiers it was on bottles so you just were like well clearly it's a kid show put it on whether or not you like consciously made that choice but like hmm, I'm I'm curious because I know cult- culturally I'm a little distant on the U.S. side because I didn't grow up watching Winnie the Pooh or the, like Beatrix Potter is probably the closest thing I read to that stuff but did you guys have like the peanuts or anything like that? No, that's strangely not. That's something I I do quite like. Obviously, like Snoopy and Charlie Brown, but never really. That wasn't something that was easily accessible over here. Really, it's more in later life when I've kind of like, oh, like like I'd like the style, but I never really like sat down and like watched an episode. There's not even episodes. It was just like a holiday thing. There's a yeah, Charlie yeah. Brown yeah. movie for every single holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I guess I, I, the reason I ask this stuff is I'm, I'm always curious about how or I'm being coming more curious on like people's childhoods and whatnot, because like I, in preparation for next month, I, I read some, or I listened to some biographies on Lefkadio Hearn, who's the guy who really brought Japanese mm. folklore to the American audience and the British audience. And I kind of have a similar ish similar enough like his like reading history as a kid because like i was reading ghost stories sure and stuff so like i i really related with this portion of dreams because this is stuff like i would read as a kid because it was like, fascinating <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> sounds like what you do well, like for me on the sub- subject of that like what read when i was like a like in maybe like eight or ten or whatever we like the, Go- the goosebumps books mm-hmm. definitely yeah and that would be that's like so at first out and into horror is it like rather than a, a, rather than a visual sense more of a reading sense really and getting into those and then the, there was a tv series of course but um, there was but yeah. it was something special yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i was watching like unsolved mysteries and stuff as a kid oh so. sure i think it depends <laughs> also like what access you had like i had pretty much just pbs for a hot second and then like a good portion of the books were scholastic fair books so like if those two places didn't have it I wasn't getting a hold of it. Yeah, by the time I remember having like more channels, it was like on AFN, which was the Armed Forces Network, and we only had like seven channels. And by then, I only was watching like how it was made. Yeah, I mean, I knew of Sky TV back in the day, just we didn't pay for it. Exactly. Yeah, I was not paying for that. <laughs> yeah, don't blame me. <laughs> so, of this first chapter of dreams, did you guys really like this chapter, or was it just kind of one of those eh chapters for you? I think like this is definitely one of the stronger elements of the what I would consider the folklore element to it because let's say like the the mysterious foxes even though they're not as they're obviously the representative people in like makeup with costumes essentially rather than actually like kind of looking like actual foxes or something like or some kind of like humanoid real humanoid looking ones mm. but a more like, I feel like a cautionary tale kind of thing like the mother said like don't go and do it but then it's like oh well you got it now. You got to re- repent for your sins, and it's like, well, you might might see you again, might not. Kind of <laughs> thing. <laughs> but I feel like, yeah, and then it's like, oh, that's that's it. That the, the story's over. It's like, what happened? Kind of thing. And like, you want a bit more for that one, I think. But hundred percent. Yeah, I think you thought I wasn't going to enjoy it because like it ended abruptly, hmm. and that's one of my pet peeves. Where I'm like, I want to know everything. <laughs> I don't want to have to make up my own ending. But I actually really enjoyed the whole aspect of it because it it just brought you back to being a child I feel like you just was watching it through a child's eyes the makeup on the fox's face was fantastic as well like the masks that they were Mm -hmm. like wearing the whole outfit the color everything was just beautifully done Mm -hmm. and even at the end of the rainbow I feel like because he was so sweet I feel like in my head he got away with it to be fair (laughs) well that rainbow could be perceived a little darkly prince uh, mentioned and that, that last scene with the rainbow and mm. the flowers beautiful beautiful scene but him being handed the dagger and the kid being told to go kill himself he <laughs> he theorizes that this could be a tie to one kurosawa's brother's suicide mm, and sure. as well as kurosawa's attempted suicide so there's like that oh, little no. dark tone that kind of brings an autobiographical bit in where it's like oh that changes that Tone all together. But, sure, but it could also be like more of like a death of childhood. Like he's mm-hmm. he's done exploring and like having that wonder. Yeah. No, I, I yeah, I can definitely see that. I like that idea better. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, that that's what I like about movies like or segments like this is where it's like, here's just this vignette. Now you can mm-hmm. try and interpolate or figure out yourself. Because I, I agree with your points of like, this is a return to childhood. And it's a very good intro to what becomes a very heavy and dark movie for the most part. Yeah, no, it, this first part definitely like was my favorite of the whole movie. But it was my favorite in that like in contextually, I enjoyed the story. But it was such a short and sweet story that I felt like there could have been a, like a full movie made out of just this one mm-hmm. tiny bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. I, I can see that. And I mean, even then, like the second one, the second story, the Peach Orchard does have that childhood feel to it, too, where mm-hmm. there's that little mm-hmm. bit of ghosts and stuff and like the spirit of the land that we see prevalent mm-hmm. in a lot of Japanese folklore movies of like mm-hmm. even like anime like Princess Mononoke or half of ghibli yeah 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 yeah, yeah. (laughs) pretty much yeah so what were your guys's uh first impressions of the peach orchard yeah i straight away i knew for some reason she was some form of blossom i don't know how i kind of already got to that because she was obviously this girl that you could he could only see but no one else could and it made you think well actually she stood next to like what looked like a cherry blossom pot Plant. Mm-hmm. and I was like ah oh, maybe she is like a spirit of some form I really liked the kind of innocent that it came like bless him when he did follow her and then he cried his little eyes out because like I really liked the peach trees and I think it's that innocence again within this that I quite enjoy mm-hmm. also I do love nature in, in, a, in its finest so I feel like having that respect for a tree mm-hmm. is one of those things where I do think we'd we need it. We, we actually really do need trees. They're important things. <laughs> so actually chopping them down is not really necessary. And us traveling to Japan was one of the most wonderful things. Like we had to go in cherry blossom season because it's just beautiful to see. The only pet peeve I had. <laughs> do you know what I'm going to say? No. The, the blossom was square. That was my only downside I had. Like they, they didn't have the time to just round the blossoms. Do you mean the pattern? Yeah, <laughs> that was my only downside. <laughs> well, to be fair, I mean, you're talking about like the big blossom blowing scene at the end. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So that was all yeah. done by hand. So like that, like I, I, I completely understand them trying to cut down a little bit because also keeping those blossoms fresh. They did that entire shot in like one day. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you'd That's have impressive. to. Yeah. So, so that would be then the the use of like uh, industrial light and magic using for that effect. Then, I, I, is that what you mean? No, I think it, it was just them thro- throwing stuff into fans. I really like the oh, okay. like yeah. two guys in yeah. the background with handfuls of flower petals talking like <laughs> an industrial <laughs> fan. Yeah. It makes sense now you're saying it though because you are getting more blossom from one side. Right. I think it's on the left hand side. Yeah. The, the right hand yeah. side is not pulling the weight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so I'm glad you picked up on the fact that she was a ghost and like was able to tell that without like knowing why. And I think part of it is because the way it's filmed is when he sees the g- girl for the first time, then it cuts back. It's a jar holding a peach branch. Yeah. So there's those yeah. like visual ties and poetry that he's putting into it. And also good pick up on that too, because the, they're actually celebrating a festival that day. It's Hana Matsuri, which is Doll Day or Girls Day, but it was originally called the Peach Festival. And I like that. It's like that kind of changing of festivals and ideas mm. that, hey, this is what this started off as, but now I change it. Like in Germany, where Oktoberfest originally was in October, but they moved it up to September because the weather was better. I mean, understandable. <laughs> Oktoberfest here happened in July, so. <laughs> yeah, you missed it. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> i think it's interesting too because th- this tale itself is there there's other stories in line with it and that's one thing like I, in my research i was I, i'm reading the yanagita kunio guide to japanese folklore and that one's very it's very cliff notesy but then in the side un, or underneath the story he brings out all the differences mm-hmm. there's a story in kaiden that's called Juroku Zakura, which where the tree's dying and an old man commits suicide because he's not going to live much longer. So he gives his life to the gods to make the tree mm, bloom. Mm-hmm. And so it's that, that that there's more to that too. But there, there's that tie of giving oneself for nature as well as mm. the sacrifice of nature for us. 
Well, and I think the other thing that's interesting, and it's, it's, I think, more tied to Japanese interpretations of, like, the love of trees, because I think worldwide we have a version of it, like, having a spirit of a tree or having, like, a guardian tree, pretty common. But it seems like in Japan, and it might just because they have an overabundance of trees that are overly beautiful, but it's almost always a flowering tree that is, like, the center of the story, the representation of, like, someone's undying love. It's always cherry. It's always plum tree. It's never just, like, a standard oak. Mm. <laughs> Whereas here, like, <laughs> it, the best we've got is maybe a willow tree. <laughs> apple tree, maybe? Maybe an apple. Yeah, like, like, maybe an apple tree. Those are, like, pretty, like... They have pretty flowers. They give us like beautiful fruit, but also like there, I think we have just like a different connection with trees. I think, I feel like Japan has this appreciation for tree, but also like an undying love of beauty and like mm. an art to the tree. Whereas I think we see trees much more practically. We still have like an affiliation and love for them, but usually it's like, oh, oak is really great for woodworking and like building a house, you know, willow you can like weave with it an apple tree you can eat as opposed to just the beauty of the blossoms. Because mm. you can think of, like, bonsai tree as well. Like, that's straight away in Japan. They love caring and looking after so, a bonsai. Yeah, meticulous in how they care for those. Is, yeah. And even, like, the traditional, like, flower arrangement. Like, here, it's usually, like, big... Like, we do big arrangements of, like, a lot of flowers, usually. Mm. Like, that's very traditional. Even, like, going back a long ways, like, for churches, it would be, like, a big wreath or a big, like ribbonish display of flowers whereas there it's like three branches beautifully perfectly arranged so that way that's kind of the like time and spent in the beauty of it yeah there's a language to the arrangement of flowers yes yeah but it's i think there's just like a more intense focus on like just the beauty of the tree which i think goes along well with like the girl scenario that happens in this story like having the the tree be this beautiful little girl or beautiful girl helps in the like the storytelling as opposed to just like the tree by itself because you they could have redone it where like the tree has no personification and you would have had a similar ish story but mm. i don't think it would have been connected as much interesting because yeah the only thing i can think of at least between like the uk and the us and even more so it's more european but like the green man true yeah or i don't know i'm, I'm sure there's some other spirit i'm missing I mean, hell, if you look at, like, Tolkien's work of... Tolkien really was into trees. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Why am I thinking of, you know, the old Oaky song? The what? On top of old Oaky. Isn't it old Smoky? Is it old Smoky? No. Am I being singing it wrong? Yeah. Don't tell me yeah. I'm singing it wrong. Isn't it, I think on, it top is on top of old Smoky? smoky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damn it. Making up my own song, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'll ask you about that later. <laughs> So, Paul, Paul, what did you think about this whole uh, bit with the trees and the spirits? Um, I I found it interesting the fact that this time that I've forgotten that the, how like um, the, obviously the the representations of the 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 the, the, to the torn down trees and everything like these like foreboding, well, like echoing sounded voices of these people like oh you've you know, you've done bad here like it's like no time no no use for tears now kind of thing. It's like, you've, you know, like man's humanity is like, you just stripped it and thing. It's like, we look what you've done kind of thing. It's like, you got to just deal with what's what's happened here. And yet the, the boy's like crying his eyes out, bless him. And it's a little, oh, I feel a bit sad for him. But then one of the other the people's like, oh no, no, it's not his fault kind of thing. And it's like the innocence of that. It's like, you know, he doesn't, it's not, don't blame one person just for the, humanity you know stripping away the beauty of nature and everything but it's like a, well because you love them we'll go, give you one last viewing of the trees in the, the beauty and they have the whole the sequence all those i love the whole instrumentation of the, like, the japanese instruments and stuff like i really love, really love that stuff so that it's been like um felt that felt like a very much like in like a th theatrical in the sense of like when you'd sit down in like one of those what well, is a kabuki here kabuki theaters and everything like that and just be like embracing like a, as a concert essentially for what it is and that's just uh, i really like the <laughs> what they had to offer for that and then obviously having the seeing the the trees and everything is like oh yeah, yeah and then it's like then just quickly realizing it's all right take taken away just like that again and and then it's like kind of like 
got to live with it. But I think it's quite poetic because you've got that one single tree that's yeah, left there. stood there. Yeah. And I think mm-hmm. I like the aspect of that being the little girl in that mm-hmm. tree. Mm-hmm. And I always think, to me, a tree, any plant, it's a living thing. It, it, it does need water. It needs light. It's just like us, really. You just can't get up and walk. That's the only difference I see it as. So I think, except for banana trees, banana trees do walk. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? There are some trees that walk, just not all trees. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there are, aren't there some like things in the desert that kind of get up and move that to where the, the, the for the sunlight is there? Am I right in thinking that there's something like that? that there's exists? a tree I know that like pulls itself in the jungle and banana trees are famous for not staying in a row that you plant them they kind of wander off a little bit but not like a lot like a foot or two but enough to be like not in a straight line anymore (laughs) is that just the roots shifting in the ground is that they kind of like scooch them scooch their way around that's impressive (laughs) see well i've learned something new on this podcast always (laughs) (laughs) well and speaking of that dance itself, that dance is actually the Gagaku dance of the court, and it's a court ritual and for Shinto ceremonies of Kyoto during the uh, 15th century, and it's stemming from the uh, Sarugaku mimes of the 12th and 14th century. So they're mu- it's a much older dance, and it's kind of that changing again, the changing of times where that all that doll festival originally was a peach festival, and that dance is something mm-hmm. of the older days where I'm guessing when this is said, it's probably either late Sengoku or Edo era sometime probably. around there or something, yeah. something more contemporary. It's definitely more contemporary. And I'm going to tell you again to play Okami because once again, <laughs> this scene reminded me so strongly, there is an old man in the town of Okami oh. and like the tree is like, just like in this, it's a personification. Granted, it's not a girl. It's a very busty butt lady mm. with cutouts to look like peaches for her boobies and her butt. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, he also, like, he, like, gets fully wasted and he believes that if he does this dance just right, the trees will bloom. And it's your job as the god to actually bloom the trees for this little delusional <laughs> old man. And, like, it did remind me a lot of it, but in, like, a different way. That mm-hmm. one has, like, this, this, like celebration of the trees where this one felt more like a appreciation of the trees okay you know like it similar ideas definitely coming from like the same base roots and concepts but like two different understandings of like how of the end goal okay i can see that and for me like this one was interesting because i my thoughts on the trees themselves while beautiful and poetic it's also a very It's, it's, I don't think it's, it's a transition from the last one was to appreciate nature as it is and respect Mm -hmm. the kind of supernatural of it. But this one is more so you, it's, it's this hybridization of where it's beauty that partially stems from nature, but it's only beautiful Mm -hmm. because it's arranged for us. It's an orchard. Yeah. It's not the naturally growing like forest of Mm -hmm. peach trees. These have been planted for a specific purpose and so we've and we once they've outlived that purpose we get rid of it it's this kind of sad beauty of like we've arranged this stuff that this kid is gonna love Mm -hmm. but it's also our part to cut it down when we need other uses for that land true yeah no it it also does bring about the idea of like what point does the land and the tree become its own like here we have like the national parks where like that's how you protect and like make sure no one touches it but like a city park could theoretically be rezoned. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, the idea of like, at what point is it on us to like end this cherry tree's life? Yeah. Well, it's also like if any, any, most of our landscapes, we have the windbreaks that are like these groups of trees to prevent erosion. And then also if you look over like a wheat field, it's like, Oh, that's a beautiful wheat field. But I mean, we are going to eat all of that, but it's also an artificial construction. Oh, very. Yeah. They're not great for the land. (laughs) (laughs) um yeah no and it is an interesting point too because like he he doesn't fall in love with a natural forest he falls in love with an orchard that's been specifically curated to be beautiful Mm -hmm. kind of in ties with like the bonsai just a little bit yeah because i mean anything Mm -hmm. can be a bonsai you just are like forcing it to stay tiny by trimming its roots and keeping it in a small pot Mm -hmm. and like then feeding it you know enough to like keep it going it's the idea Mm -hmm. of a young old a young looking old tree Mm-hmm. Yeah, forever youthful. Mm-hmm. 
But also on, on the what well, Paul, when you brought up no tears, even, even when the movie was playing, my mind just couldn't <laughs> help but go to Hellraiser. Yeah, no but... tears, it's a waste of good <laughs> suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie, have you seen Hellraiser? No. No. no that's... <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to. I will vouch for you there. Maybe, maybe on the list for this year. So. <laughs> I, no, we're not doing it. <laughs> if I've been told I don't want to, I'm not going to. I need to put my foot down. That one I think you can skip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do think so. Uh, just tying it back into a little bit of history and actually a little bit of suffering too. The one surviving sapling Prince mentioned that it might represent Momoyong, which is one of Kurosawa's sisters who died suddenly. This poor man's family is just dropping left and right throughout this movie, Nico. Hmm. You're yeah. not helping. <laughs> <laughs> that That's kind of the last little bit of that though. Okay, I'm glad you're <laughs> yeah. not telling me he's like eight siblings, they're all <laughs> <Yeah>. dead. <laughs> But it's just kind of like that sad bit of like, e even though like everything's dead except for this one. Sure. And I think especially for a guy like, like this director, like he's always been very symbolic. And like, even in films where he isn't necessarily talking about himself, there's always like people who can make a reference to something about him and his life. And I think you don't ever forget those people of having that symbolism, whether or not it's fully like intended for everyone else or if it's just for himself i think it's a really like key point to like why people love his work mm -hmm. so on to the next dream the blizzard so cold <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you do feel cold watching this yeah <laughs> did this give you uh quite in flashbacks a little bit yeah yeah yes 100 mm -hmm. yeah i said to soap like, oh yeah this is yeah reminded me of a similar thing that we've in that story which <laughs> and um and this one i mean you do feel the drag on this one and and i'm, I'm not just because of the fact there's slow, the slow motion going on in it but it just just feels like it does go on for a but i don't know if that's purposeful because again it's like oh, you're kind of traversing through the snow in such a, a uh, thing and it's uh, in a way that's kind of just like oh it's like you just want to kind of give up and everything mm. like with the nature of of that but i think for me it was the breathing i know this sounds really daft but you know when you don't actually realize that we breathe like all the time and you don't subconsciously actually aware of breathing it is right. and then when you hear someone struggling to breathe it finds it quite challenging so i was watching it thinking am i am i breathing now <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that idea of like when you watch like characters dive into water and like subconsciously you like mm -hmm. realize you're holding your breath just a little bit <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. and I think that's what it is with this one and I think this was more from the previous two we just had kind of this one was more hard hitting initially mm -hmm. with how it, it kind of went from like this nice little fluffy part to like a bit more hard hitting like oh gosh these people could actually die on this cliff mountainside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they can't see anything mm -hmm. at all yeah and it also feels like this isn't necessarily this could be anybody's dream it doesn't necessarily feel like it's kurosawa in that moment it could be a, 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 like i say a, a chapter from any film like from Quiden in, mm -hmm. in a similar way kind of just a, a repeat kind of thing of the the sort of uh, lady of the snow or is it a y yuki yuki ona yuki ona, like the snow yeah. yeah yeah the spirit snow spirit base of of that so um yeah i so said that again this is, ties back more to the a folklore element to that you know like uh, oh yeah there's you get lost in the mountains and yeah, this, you may be saved or you may be eaten, I guess, by a uh, vengeful spirit of some kind or whatever, I think is... They, but I think in this case, he was saved, I would say. And then it's like, oh, yeah, the, the snow clear, the, the, the snowstorm clears, and then he finds the camp that he needs to be in, as opposed to just being, right, I'm going to take you in and eat you, basically. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and so I think what's, what's interesting about this part, because this, is, this isn't the end of where we'll see yokai or any type of reference to folklore mm -hmm. but this is for me is this is one of the very few scenes that i like slow motion that's impressive you hate slow motion i hate slow motion unless it's done well <laughs> because for me what this is this is a very 
poetic portrayal of the struggle against nature mm -hmm. and how weather can bog you down, especially the cold mm -hmm. itself. But yeah. like this is this is where previously like we saw that the kitsune were dangerous in their own right, mm -hmm. but this one nature is dangerous in itself. And then you have mm -hmm. the falling back of mixing in the dangers of folklore around it too, and kind of like once yeah. you're once you're struggling. Even though you, the, the mountaineer maybe doesn't doesn't believe that the Yukiona is a thing, mm -hmm. and this is just him reverting back to his childhood brain of the fears that have been told through us through generations of folktale. Oh sure, but, I mean I think everybody's a afraid to be stuck in a snowstorm and b afraid to be trapped by either snow lady or maybe the yeti or you know a bear mm -hmm. or in some people's <clears throat> cases your cannibalistic stranded friends. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The Andes people. Yeah, it's poor soccer team guys. No. Oh. But th this one, I mean, that one they, ha they had to. There was no other no, option. No, they did. They, I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying it unlocked a new fear. <laughs> but, but with this one, it's, I, I think probably the reason it's a stark difference for everyone is because the last two are celebrations of nature, mm -hmm. whereas this, mm -hmm. uh, this is more so in a human conquering of nature in the fact that they do make it to the camp, they make it through the hardships of nature. And we also get sure. to see the ugly side of nature too. It's not, we trespass in an area we shouldn't be. If the spirits mm -hmm. were there and they shouldn't be there, they wouldn't have made it. Conquering. Yes. But I'm going to argue the conquering word just a tiny bit, because I think at least in North America, we have a bunch of movies of people like surviving the wilderness, you know, with their dog or their llama or their donkey and like you know they tackle wilderness and they go through and like at the end like they have learned their lesson and they are truly like you know the davy crockett of their era and or like they climb a mountain and they like conquer the mountain right whereas this one they survived and they considered that good enough mm. <laughs> they're like congratulations <laughs> nobody's dead good job well done we should go home <laughs> yeah. and i think that's like more on par for like a japanese like warning story right because like a lot of at least american like warning stories of like how dangerous nature is unless it's set in like the future and there's zombies and wolves have escaped the zoo because they froze the ocean mm -hmm. sort of nonsense most of the time it's like a if you just try hard enough if you're just tough enough man enough you could possibly conquer nature as well this one guy did look at this one guy yeah. whereas japan i think like they have a much more like cautionary tales like you might you might live that would be conquering, but it would suck. Like, I think they're much more balanced as far as, like, is the, like, what is, what is, what are you gaining versus what are you, like, having to live through to get that gain? Like, you, it sucked, mm. but you did survive versus, like, oh, man, that sucked, but now you're famous, have a book deal, and a movie made about you. Yeah. Now that you bring that up, I'm trying to think, and maybe Paul can help out on this. I don't think I've known, I, I don't think I've ever watched like a UK like natural horror film of... Where would they go? Where is the, like how far away is nature? I mean like here, like you can get real lost. I know. How, like the and UK is so tiny. Well, just Europe. You walk in, far enough. <laughs> well, Europe in general too. I, I don't think I've seen one unless it's I'm like sure Russia, supernatural involved. I'm sure Russia and Germany have to have one. They have some pretty big wilderness and I just don't know what that much Russian films. The the way, the best I can give you is maybe like in Scotland, like mm. with the mountains and stuff like that. There's a lot of like beautiful untouched scene landscape uh, out there, and there's I, I, I mean the, I think there's been some horror films that kind of go into that, like oh being lost in the woods in that capacity of of that. But um, yeah, no nowhere near the the scape of what say like say in like the trees in Oregon or anything like that. That kind of like big open wilderness, like it just goes on forever kind of mm. thing. <laughs> But it's really cold up in Scotland as well. Yeah, yeah. I just don't think it would work either for you guys, because like here, there's there's not just like empty land, but there's also just like an agreement of like, oh, you just don't go out and like wander around. Like if there's a field, you are not welcome to wander around it. That's some guy's field, and he has his cows on it. Whereas it's my understanding mm -hmm. that like if there's a path, y'all are welcome to walk through this guy's field with his cows as long as you close the gate behind you. Yeah, yeah, there is there is that, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. is, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Like we could... And I think it's just a different mindset, because that's much more friendly approach than here, where, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you never know what's on the other side of that field. Mm -hmm. That's fast. Yeah. 
that's true like even like wild camping like i feel like if you're doing that over in the states i don't know i feel like there'd be some person out there that's just living there wildly mm-hmm. and then it's going to kill you or something in your sleep i feel like that would happen over there i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> oh. it is i mean it is something though that we do think about like there's plenty of friends i know who have like ditched out on camping somewhere because like it's first come first serve they're in the mountains and they're like yep some guy found our camp and we don't trust him so we're heading home <laughs> yeah i'm trying to think because like i of the uk folklore i know the only like cannibalistic family i can think of is the bean family and that's most Mm. likely they never existed yeah i I mean i feel like it's also just like a friendlier like way of existing like there's more of an understanding of like we're all here hiking we're all here camping like it's not a big deal Mm. whereas like it is less likely that you're running into someone if you're truly like backpacking Mm. like unless you're on a big popular trail or in a state that's like much more dense like there's a good chance that you're not running into anybody while you're doing this big trail so like it would be a little bit spookier i think to like Mm. just Mm. be wandering around because like it's not you're not likely to find them the surprise i think is an added an added spook okay well maybe i just have a different perspective because like i've done sub-zero camping before built my own shelters and stuff so no i have too and it's not the it's not necessarily always the the like elements that are Mm. the like the surprise i think movies here try and make it that seem that way like oh this guy conquered a brown bear and it was freezing cold and he got mud in his boots that he had to make himself with his own two hands but i think just like there's also that baseline of like american understanding of like we're not necessarily like set up for like communal hiking like there's not a support system always set up like unless you're doing one of the big trails and like let people know like hey doing the appalachian trail hoping to hit the water stop here here and here someone come find me if I don't make it like there's like an understanding there that I think the Japanese version of like the blizzard story Mm -hmm. doesn't have the like they have a different base understanding of like what it's like to be outside because I think their idea of like outsideness and like has developed with these stories all over these years so like camping is a much more gentler thing than here like from Mm -hmm. what I have seen from people who go camping in Japan like it is not the same low level of camping like we have pretty low standards for what counts as a campground oh oh so theirs is like a more manicured camping than ours of trek trekking it out into the wilderness and and hoping for the best and you hope for like a ring to put your stuff in yeah like like, there there's like an understanding i think that like the baseline is needed to understand like this the true scariness of blizzard because like they are like generally like they're they have a more communal like oh if you are out like someone's gonna go find you or like you you're more likely to run into somebody like these four people are out in the mountain and there's nobody and they're just inches or feet from their actual campsite that they were supposed to be at well let, let's let, let's also make a distinction these guys aren't camping no. they're mountaineers they are mountaineers however you know tit for tat they're outside <laughs> <laughs> but i guess that's like an equivalent of um in the uk like going up snowdonium or like the peaks or something like yeah, that yeah like something it, more but, extreme than just your your standard outdoor backpacker trip these guys are out there so far and they're so close to their goal <laughs> <laughs> so true but i think for us it's still like what's the word made like a tourist attraction mm-hmm. i think where they're going is definitely somewhere off yeah the off, 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 off the beaten path essentially yeah they're not really supposed to be there but... and i don't think they're well prepared actually for that situation like mm-hmm. yes okay they've got loads of stuff in there like rucksacks and such but i'm thinking if you're going up to that high altitude and peak and you know it's gonna be a blizzard is there some form of oxygen you need and is there something i don't know yeah, back then is high some... mm-hmm. yeah they kind of yeah and, and i think as well it's the understanding of why they're there like in the first place yeah, yeah. what's the the purpose of their actually being there is not necessarily clear unless the 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 you've got some info on that nope just no. three four men up in the mountain dying <laughs> i feel like this has been <laughs> produced like by almost any other director just the blizzard would have been a full feature length two-hour movie where uh. like we were uncomfortably understanding just one guy and like everyone else is kind of a weird background character mm. and then there's like because like this is an interesting plot but i like how kurosawa like he doesn't answer almost any questions you have. He's just like, don't worry about it. So picture this, four guys on the mountain. You're like, okay, who are they? He's like, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, it's himself. It is himself. But at the same time, like yeah. he's not giving extra unneeded, imp- like 
because it would be nice to know, but I don't necessarily need to know. Like, I know they're out there mm-hmm. on the mountain. I know they're getting stuck. And I know there's, like, the, like, beautiful version of a Yeti coming to kill them. <laughs> Yukiana is different than a Yeti altogether, but... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty. Much prettier. <laughs> Well, I, I think I think the reason this is a good turning spot is the men all feel relatively young. Mm-hmm. So it's this turning point from these two more childish stories to uncertainty of adulthood. Sure. Yeah. Not being able to see what's in front of you sort of mindset. Yeah. Sure. I, I get it. I just it's one of those. There's so much more that could have been. And I don't hate that it's short, but I do wish I knew more. Like if this mm. if there had been a book about this part i would have been very interested so and i i wonder because that's that's been brought up by all three of you at some point or another that this is that you always wanted more from this Mm -hmm. and i wonder if that's just to have a better emotional connection to these rather abstract stories i think that don't really it doesn't give you the time to connect to that one main character i think so i think part of it is like the way this movie is done is almost like a visual version of poems which isn't necessarily bad it's just poems are very difficult to do and feel satisfied with Mm -hmm. because most poems you can either just enjoy it by itself or you can do like the big deep dive into what each word and like the format means and like who the author was and it's an understanding that that's like an option whereas I think a lot of times when you watch movies that's not necessarily the understanding of like an option for you so I think it's just uh, you know a lack in like normalization i guess of like a visualized poem they're not as common i think like mm. the sort of like short collection stories aren't as popular so they're a little less i'm less likely to have found on my own this makes me feel yeah so chris has brought this up multiple times i like like the magical thought portion of that horrible movie cats yes this is kind of like it. I, this yes. is this is probably why, like they, do, a lot of times when they have those short stories, because I know the uh, Beatrix Potter stories got turned into a movie too. They did, where mm-hmm. they they try and take these like short, cute stories mm-hmm. and shoeball them into like some larger narrative that doesn't work. Yeah, and I I do wonder if they did get those opportunities, if those would have been well as well received compared to like this one, if they tried to string along a large narrative. Maybe not even necessarily a large narrative, but just a a better comprehension of like why the stories tie together. Because hmm. I, I I think it's very artsily done, and once you know, it's understandable and like not too hard to grasp. But like I don't think it's like as readily available for the general watcher to like understand who Kurosawa is, understand his like full life and like all of his siblings that are dying around him, <laughs> <laughs> and like his and like his uncertainty in like life in general like he's always been a little bit on the depressive Edgar Allan Poe version of life as opposed to like sunshine and rainbows version of life <laughs> yeah because even when he does do sunshine and rainbows it's, it's a kid still that's, depressing yeah <laughs> so Paul and Sophie what are your guys thoughts on like this interconnection of dreams because t- truthfully on my side real quick I do think this is a better connected anthology than many of the other anthology movies I've watched. That's true. I think it's just a problem with anthologies for myself. Mm-hmm. What What are your thoughts? Do you think the dreams are well connected together? Um, I think more to the, as it goes to the back end, they seem to have more of a, a theme as we'll get on to those ones. But for jumping from the, the Peach Order to the Blizzard, mm. I feel like that's, that's quite somewhat of a big gap. I feel like there could have been maybe one where he was more of a a, a young adult, maybe let's just say, say he was like 12, 13 or something, and then go to the one that the, the next one where he would be a, a sort of much younger man of about maybe 18 or something like that, perhaps. Because it feels like it's a big jump. And like I say, the fact that it's kind of like a this doesn't f- that maybe it's just the fact because it is he's so obscured in sort of the, the blizzard and everything that you couldn't really tell that that could be almost anybody really in that scenario really it's just like it's not necessarily relating to him except for obviously there is obviously deeper meaning for him that's why he included it as a, mm. a piece but I, I don't know the other the, 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 the... I think for me I I always if I have a dream I would interpret it my dream I really like the idea of a dream is something subconsciously either worrying me or is something I'm wanting to succeed in or something like that and it's kind of a back in your thought and you might you're subconsciously not aware that you're thinking about it. 
And I think the first two are quite childlike and you kind of get that aspect of them. And then this one's a massive jump. And I don't know, for me, when I'm watching it, I'm getting quite anxious for them, thinking, oh my God, they're going to die. And then that makes me think of, well, actually, what state is this kind of showing? Is he stuck in his life? Is he trapped as a blizzard showing like he's in a in a part of his life where he's he's in a rut and he can't move past something, so he can't see? And I think this is how I'm kind of then interpreting that. But I think I agree with you, Paul. Something in the middle that was a little bit maybe more harsh compared to like the fox and the, the peach blossom might have made that edge then just to like an absolute... Mm stormy blizzard feel a little bit easier mm-hmm. like for the transition yeah. i think going through the rest the transitions work really well i think mm-hmm. this one's just a bit of a bigger jump yeah that's all i think well, that. so kind of continuing on to the the fourth dream the tunnel mm-hmm. i think that uncertainty works quite well if this is like that reflection of japanese history because mm-hmm. the tunnel is very much so a post-world war ii so it's mm-hmm. kind of like the first two are childish but by the time Kurosawa would have been at that age, they were in the middle of war. They had lost mm-hmm. their childhood. So there's that gap where now there are, there's that uncertainty. So I think that missing link it's, is yeah, actually that's really bothered. important. Yeah. Well, it, it's also something to that I think a lot of people forget is that Japan was at war with China in the second Sino-Japanese War for two years before World War II even broke out. And mm-hmm. even before that, the invasion of Manchuria in 1931 and the conflicts with Russia at the same time too. So we think of World sure. War, at least in the US, we think of World War II as like this four-year time frame. Japan was in mm-hmm. World War II for, or was in at war for 17 years. Yeah, and like, I mean, right. World War One, then they just kind of kept going. Mm-hmm. And that, so that that's it's also important to, I do want to point out, Kurosawa never served in war like many of the other directors of his time. Mm-hmm. And he never directly made an anti-war film. He only did one propaganda film, The Most Beautiful, because the studio made him. But it's uh, it's interesting to see how his writing of war is so much different than, say, like Nobuhiko Obayashi, who mm-hmm. directed House, who, who did an anti-war trilogy. Mm-hmm. His are very much more terrifyingly fanciful too Mm -hmm. or masaki kobayashi who did the human condition and yeah i I think the tunnel does read a little bit from like an outside point of view like it does feel very much like a story that's been told to him but i don't think that's necessarily like a a minus for the movie i think especially coming off of the blizzard scene into this into the tunnel movie i feel like the the feeling is set already like for kind of the the hopelessness um so i think i do think it works whereas like i do i do agree like especially you can see a pretty stark difference for directors who have served especially like a, a portrayal of what they themselves is thinking so i i think they are very different but i don't i don't dislike kurosawa's interpretation of like how war affected himself even if it's from like an outside perspective Mm, yeah well and that's that's something like i i think about this quite often because i do watch a lot of japanese anti-war movies Mm -hmm. and there there is a stark difference even between like european war movies american war movies and japanese war movies where european feels really reflective of like why did we even let this happen how did it get to this point like the Mm -hmm. the german or the european one is very much a little bit more depressing, but depending on who the viewpoints it, yes, from, very much so. I feel the allies mm-hmm. are a lot more hopeful in their depictions at the end, or it's a little I mean, bit more positive. It's a lot easier to write the ending to that movie. Yeah, yeah very much so. <laughs> but but then you go to like the American movies of that era, and I know we've gone through like a bit of like a pacifist of maybe we shouldn't be into war. But I mean, ours yeah. tend to have that overtone of yeah america we're the we're the saviors of the world could it possibly have been written any different though i mean look at us Mm, no (laughs) (laughs) well that and i i I agree there's definitely a more america vibe to our war films in general but we we also have a much more like a hard focus on individualists and like groups and like friendships that are made through war as opposed to like Mm. i think a lot of european movies see things from a much wider picture there's Mm. a lot more like interaction between full nations or like 
it you get to see who's at the high table making decisions as opposed to just like the one guy in the trenches with his you know sad sad, soggy feet and his best friend and i i do think it's interesting seeing the japanese version of it because this is i mean this is from someone whose friends were had to deal with war that he saw that shape the world around him and i think you can see it really well in like his interpretation of like the ghost soldiers and then like how the dog plays a role into the whole story i think really like it's it's almost a in between of the two because he had such an outside perspective of like he can see the bigger picture because he's not there Hmm. but he also knows very personally like how this is affecting people yeah i mean i can i can see that and so one one thing i do want to point out that i think is interesting about this transition is we've gone from these three stories that have folklore in them to one that has ghosts, but they don't feel like folklore ghosts. They're just... They're just ghosts. Yeah. yeah these are just standard ghosts. And then, like, I don't know, a cute doggy who's there to die? Because <laughs> uh, anti-tank donkeys aren't fun. You strap bombs to them and tell them to run under the tank. That That's something that, that was... Uh, I mean, for, but... For those, un- for those unfamiliar, the Germans did have anti-tank dogs. So did we. <laughs> and they're, the, the, the sad thing about the German ones is uh, they, they trained them with diesel tanks. Their and own tanks. the Allies used gasoline. So the Our... dogs would come back to their tanks because they were trained to go to diesel. The smell yeah. of diesel, not yeah. the smell of gasoline. Yeah, I mean, we weren't much better. We, we strapped bombs to a lot of things, not just dogs. So we have no room to talk, but yeah, I think it adds to the, like the level of constant, like hopelessness in this part of the movie, Mm -hmm. because not only are his friends already dead and don't know it, like they're still trying to continue on, but this dog that is like a bit like, cause it, dogs are meant to be comforting. Like most humans find dogs comforting. He's clearly trying to find some comfort in the dog. The dog is trying to comfort him, but like the dog is there to die. No. Do you, do you know what the dog is? A, I don't know. A dead ghost? It's the dog of war. Oh, sure. It, <laughs> no, that that's exactly what it is. It, I mean, I know, but like, I, I think the dog of war is one of those like idioms that like it, it works because it is two faced in a way, right? Like it, it works because the personality of a dog fits in with the idealization and like conquerization of war, but also like the sadness of sending what is you've spent a great deal of time training a friend off to die i mean that's war in general i know that's the point that's the point of this segment (laughs) his friends are dead yeah Yeah. Mm. there's a lot a lot of the the thought there's been like so the like survivor's guilt really definitely some survivor's guilt and even though he didn't technically go to go to the war he's just like he was on the outskirts and didn't get the chance to essentially go with his comrades to fight and everything and that's Mm. what it's kind of like having to deal with and the fact that he's he's having to order them essentially like give orders to them like no you you don't realize that you are dead they're, they're stuck in limbo basically and he's also like when he gives the orders to march on it's like right you can you can pass on now basically through the through mm-hmm. the tunnel to the other side so with that but well and the, the other thing too is we keep saying friends and i'm sure some of them were friends but he we got to remember he was the commander he's the guy who sent these people yeah. off to die exactly yeah. it's so, even worse yeah mm-hmm. so that that survivor's guilt i think is even more multiplied because he was also fully prepared to die alongside them yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah but i, I do kind of wonder because because we talk about our reception of the wars and whatnot and i'm sure the uk has some type of scars or may, correct me if i'm wrong on this mm-hmm. there's still that consciousness of what the war has done as a whole or the continuation of the relations mm-hmm. afterwards I would say so, but I feel like I definitely, when I'm watching any Japanese film and being over there, I feel like the war really did take a complete toll on them and they still have like that connection towards that and you can kind of feel it when you're there, especially when we went to Arishima. Yeah, with the museum, the, the Peace mm-hmm. Museum and everything like that, they make a, it's, it's, I'm making a statement with the fact of that and then it's like, it's to remind them it's like we never want to make mm. any like biological weapons like this ever again type of thing just for, for future I, generations like because like we do have like a symbol obviously we have like rem- rem- remembrance Sunday. Day, yeah yeah and we wear those poppies but actually how much has that actually gone down like generation generation i think it's kind of missing whereas i don't think it is in japanese culture yeah. mm. well i wonder because 
So there, there's a few things with that too. And maybe, and granted, I might not know the full historical context that to tie everything together. Cause I haven't done a whole lot of research on like the UK and world war two or your guys's war movies, but like there's, there's a Kurosawa said specifically uh, or why the t- the tunnel is symbolic of one of Kurosawa's quotes. The nation rushed headlong into darkness and that living through the year, the war years was like living inside a black box that emits no light. Hmm. But also there's a, there's a couple things in there too, where one, we absolutely destroyed so much of Japan yeah. when we, when we came over there, one of uh, Obayashi's movies, casting blossoms to the, into the sky is about a town that was just north of Hiroshima where they were dropping test nukes. They weren't uh-huh. full nukes, yeah. but they were the bombs that had the mechanism to set off the nuke to make sure that they would work. And it's it's a very it's a fascinating movie if you haven't seen it. But also, I think a lot of people forget that it came, it came to light a little bit more so. There was this movie trilogy called uh, well, it's more than a trilogy, but Men Behind the Sun. Mm-hmm. And it's about Unit 731, which was Japan's biological weaponry division uh, and chemical weaponry division out of Manchuria, where they tested mm-hmm. it on a bunch of local people. And they, you see, you, there is a stark difference when you look at like Kobayashi's work. Kobayashi mm-hmm. worked at one of the depots that supplied Unit 731. So he was partially directly tied to these horrible human atrocities, whereas Kurosawa l- lived on... The yeah mainland. yeah no and i think it's also just a, a uh, i guess almost romanticized version of like how japan treats history is like there's a much bigger and stronger connection i think in general and so having something so close i think is something that for a japanese audience would feel much more strongly because there's there's not a glorification like there is here. Mm-hmm. There is not a almost historic version that I think a lot of the like European nations tend to take where it's it's more history based, not necessarily hand passed down like that that pain's not passed down as strongly. And mm-hmm. I think Japan has a stronger connection with their history and their past in general and so it's it's something that pass that level of struggle and pain I think is more strongly felt and passed down than i think other places Hmm. i mean they have much more examples and like places that are like in their everyday life even in big cities that like people regularly go to they have they're much more strongly tied to trying to hold on to their traditions and their past than i think we are well and i want i wonder a little bit because i know europe has been a lot there's been a lot of uh rebuilt there was a lot of rebuilding i don't think a lot of the old bombed out places are still around but no. just in, in an architectural sense is after World War II, all the architects, that's when mo- the modernist architecture movement came up Rest because they wanted to, they, they wanted to reject everything of the past. Sure. Yeah. And I, I don't think Japan holds that same standings just hmm. kind of based off of the architecture studies that I've seen, like granted they have, there's no doubt that Japan looks and leaps into the future when it comes to technology and building but there is a reverence for the past that I don't think a lot mm-hmm. of other places have held on to since World War II. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. There, I mean, they, they, there's a conscious effort to make space for the past that I don't think we hold the same type of... Like, there, there is, there's a lot more fighting to hold on to historical things here than I think for they, than they find. Well, I do wonder if that comes from history, too, because up until like what was it 1860 japan was heavily isolated for like 200 years i think it's just it's embedded in their culture to like Mm -hmm. to have that that association to their past yeah whereas like europe and the u.s has had a lot more intermingling of different cultures so we have we don't have that i i know in europe Mm -hmm. i know people talk like there's oh there's your there's no culture it's just like well, of course there is. Every, every country sure. is a little bit different. You can't look at Buffalo Bill Cody and tell me that we don't have culture. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's different, right? There's a, there's a different pride and, like, mm-hmm. holding, I yeah. think. And I, I think the tunnel shows that really well. Yeah. Kind of like how, like, I know Germans have a very, they don't, they, there's this, the scars of World War II, mm-hmm. even if they weren't on the Nazi party. Sure. The, the, there's that still, cult, there's that group regret of what 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 they allowed to happen you know sure sure no it it definitely hits differently and i think they rebuilt 
quite quickly. I think they wanted to get to a point of where they didn't want to remember what had happened. Mm -hmm. So they did rebuild. They didn't keep anything. Like they wanted to start a new scratch and they built up quicker than we we did really, yeah. to be fair. Yeah, with a lot of um, rationing and stuff after the floor mm -hmm. and everything like that, it's a difficult thing. It's been quite get out for for many years. There was a lot of struggle. Whereas I think they they wanted to, yeah, say move on as quick as possible, <laughs> yeah, but start. still, but still remember like let's not ever add, ha let this happen again. Type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think well, if if we look at specifically like Germany and Japan, there's a big difference too. Whereas Japan, we occupied them for seven years and mm -hmm. we controlled what media they produced and help them rebuild and i think part of the, the issue the part of the, with that too is we also destroyed a bunch of their classic cinema which is very unfortunate so we yeah. lost all that pro-war japanese most of the pro-war japanese movie or the early pro samurai movies but then like germany was divided for so long between east and west mm -hmm. where one side really got built up and the other didn't sure and i, I think it also there was a huge push in germany to make sure that there would no be there wouldn't be any like shrines to neo-nazis available mm -hmm. whereas i don't think mm -hmm. japan they didn't have any say in that like that was a conscious effort on the german part to mm -hmm. to make that decision japan didn't have that say and i think they they might have picked differently because they have such a different look on how to live in history well yeah well and also a cult like because if, if you think about it germans are mostly protestant and catholic Sure. So, or no, not, not Protestant, Lutheran and Catholic. And Catholics, you have the Pope, who's Italian. That's your center. I mean... But no. then, like, Japan, you had the Emperor, who was your descendant of God on Earth. That sure, yeah. had to step down that he's not defined anymore, so you... It's a it, different feel, for sure. Exactly. Whereas... I don't know about the UK side. I don't know you guys still have the Queen, which I just love. No, also. no, honey, the Queen's dead. No, we don't. Oh, I'm right, sorry to right, break sorry. it to you. They now have a very <laughs> yeah. strange Queen, and I'm so sorry for you. Yeah. Yeah. We're really upset that our it's, Queen's passed. I'll be honest, it's one of those things where she was always the Queen. You know, like when yeah. you, you're born always with the Queen. Known, uh, yeah, there's always been a Queen uh, ever since growing up, and now suddenly, yeah. You've got a king. king. I just don't like it. <laughs> I, I won't even lie. Like, we don't either, and we don't and, have to deal with them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like I in my head I still have a queen like it feels weird when we get our money and now there's not a it's the king's head on the the coins yeah, and the, the notes and everything now it's and even the stamps yeah yeah weird. yeah yeah odd <laughs> I do also like to point out that the English royal family was German up until World War One they were a lot of things <laughs> up until a lot of points okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I think it's an interesting segment just because. Like, and I mean, hell, we we've spent like twenty minutes talking about a, a fairly ten, short part of the movie. Yeah, but I think that's impactful. Yeah. I think it does help show a like a reflective period in his life that he he really like. I mean, like we said, he he's a very depressive man. I mean, and this was part of it. Like, this is why his view in the world is the way it is. Is he had this? He had to live with this sort of haunting. Yeah, I can see that. So I do kind of wonder, uh, since we we talked about expanding the the stories, mm -hmm. with the ending with the dog of war barking at him at the end, very aggressively, I might but, add. Yes. Not wanting to be a friend is friend shape, but not wanting to be friend, Chris. Look, I'm a white lady, it's friend. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you guys think that the main character, or uh, the eye in the tunnel moved on, or do you think he just never got got over this? Can you move on from watching your friend from telling your friends to go off and die? I don't think so. It makes me think not because if the, you're saying it's the represent the dog of war that the fact that the, the dog was at the beginning and then he and then it came back at the end. It's almost like oh, it's still lingering there. So it's, mm. it's like the, the threat of maybe there might be another war in the future or mm -hmm. some other conflict perhaps, and it's just there, just like you know, he's trying to. Get away from dog in his yeah. head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, yeah, we were so fearful that there would be another war after World War Two that it we were we actively hoped there wouldn't be, and yet here we are, several wars back. It's a, it's a challenging one, isn't it? Because it makes you think. Well, is it just like a representation of his thoughts of of war? And I know lots of people have quite traumas after the fact of of being in in war, and I think that kind of resembles that kind of. In his own mind, it's still going to be subconsciously there, no matter what. I don't think he's going to ever get rid of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I can see that. I mean, we we because I re, I read a lot of manga. You st- you do see that continuation of like in Vinland Saga. Yeah, that's a good Th- example. Thorfinn has the the ghosts of everyone he's killed haunting him, even in the slave arc. Mm-hmm. And then like, but like very much visually the, in a similar vein, I would say the the berserk armor and gut in berserk. Yeah, with guts being haunted by his anger and rage taking the form of a dog. Sure. Or yeah. the hound. Yeah. No, I, I do think it is meant to, like, taint the rest of, like, the thoughts throughout the rest of the movie. Like, this is something to keep in the back of your mind as the rest continues. Yeah, ec- except for this next part, Dream 5 Crows. <laughs> sure, yeah, this tiny little segment, <laughs> sure. What, what did you guys think of Crows? Yeah, um, I... <laughs> I I feel like like with this one, it, this was probably the one that seemed to have the least interest on a second watch for me. Really, it is definitely sound. Obviously, I know it was. I've got a feeling that part of it was kind of like being inspired by art. Really, uh, like you know, looking up to somebody who obviously like a lot um, from, from a, a previous time period and seeing how they you know they they got inspired. The, their works and stuff but um i don't know just like i'm going through it like the, I, yes i recognize some of those van gogh paintings and all that kind of stuff but um just i don't i by the end it's like I, I couldn't really figure out what the crows were sort of like why it was why it was called crow other than the fact that there was at the very end which <laughs> kind of reminded me of like some like effects from the using like the hitchcock <laughs> films mm-hmm. for the birds um, but like, what does that, does that maybe like a clouded mind or something perhaps like, you know, just like a flurry of like, Oh, I don't know, like what, where my inspiration is going to lie from this, like almost like perfect scene. Maybe, I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's, there's something in that or what, or I, like, cause I'm thinking like, was, is there a photo, a, a painting of, of crows that Van Gogh did, or I, I don't know. I think there's some crows in a field, but I'm glad you picked up on admiring someone else's work. Because this was, this is the, probably the most autobiographical part minus the last, the last, or no, this, I would mm-hmm. say this is the most one, but this is a nod to Kurosawa wanting to be a painter back in the day. Mm-hmm. Cause the, the eye in this one is wearing the hat that Kurosawa usually is associated mm-hmm. with in photos of him directing, but Kurosawa right. loved Van Gogh, but knew he would never be a pro painter. So I moved to directing and he still continued to paint afterwards, but this is very much his like homage to hey i love van gogh and i honestly yeah, yeah, feel yeah. like it's just that like the crows are a little bit ominous which i i guess you could take as like him knowing that he will never be he will always have like a little bit of a black spot compared to van gogh's perfect beauty mm-hmm. but like i feel like this is just him being a little bit of a fan kid <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can see that but i i think i think there's a couple things with it because I know in crows are crows are usually a uh, omen of bad omen. Sure. And I can't remember yeah. which lore it is, but uh, crow, crow, well, there, there's one specifically that crows carry the souls of people on their backs. Mm, yeah, I don't mm-hmm. re- I don't remember where which exact where the origin of that is, but I think it's e- even though it is a little bit of a happier exploration, I do appreciate going through the process of when he starts running through the paintings, it goes through the sketches to a marker drawing, to the final painting. And even though the CGI is a, or the blue screen is a it's tad a, rough. It's a, it's a little rough. I can't say much because Obayashi, director of House, who kept using that same style of yeah. blue screen and yeah. everything he's done, even up until like 22 when he died. Sure. But I think even though this is a happier segment, it is tinted by the uncertainty of the future because very, very much so like, it reminds me a bit, uh, and maybe it's because we have had better Van Gogh depictions, like sure. specifically Loving Vincent or the Doctor Who episode. The Doctor Who episode is mwah, so good. There's, it's that he, he loves his work and he's seeing Van Gogh. If I remember right, this is at the start of Van Gogh's stint in the hospital, uh, this is where this one takes place. Yes, this would have been after the Blue Period. Yes. Yeah. But this is like, it's that ominous feeling of, yeah, you get to explore and love it, but you know that the you know end it ends is still, sad. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and again, mm-hmm. we've talked about it before, but Kurosawa is at his heart a depressed man. 
And I think it shows because like Van Gogh is a delightful painter, but there is a sadness to all of Van Gogh's work, knowing the troubles he had, Mm -hmm. right? Not just like his mental health, but also like his financial woes that he had, his trouble with love, his family, family problems that he had, like loving Van Gogh is to love sadness in a way. And I think Kurosawa is like a great fan fanboy for Van Gogh. He has very similar theming. Yeah, I can kind of see that. I'm just sorry. I'm just saying. I'm just trying. I'm trying to process some of this because I, I love Van Gogh too. Yeah. There's there's a beauty to his work, and I mm-hmm. just one of the biggest experiences for me when I was a kid was mm-hmm. going to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And oh, sure. Actually, seeing the layers of the paint. That's yeah, why I fell in love with it, sunflowers. Yeah, seeing it in person mm-hmm. really amplifies just how good of a painter he was, and then makes the fact mm-hmm. that he couldn't get any damn money for his whole life hurt that much more. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think that's always the case with painters back in the day, wasn't it? So I don't know how they actually got by, and then it's like sad that after the fact when they passed away, it's like that's when the arts were appreciated. It's mm-hmm. like a... I feel like that's with every creative field, yeah. like even like with music, like they yeah. normally get put to number one when they pass that's away, right. don't it's they? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, oh my god, that person was the greatest person mm. ever. Oh yeah, definitely. Song. Yeah, I really enjoyed this bit though. To be fair, I think it was really beautifully done like like you were saying it was a bit bit ropey but for the age of the film like to even try and attempt something like that was quite impressive and I liked the idea of stepping into a painting it reminded me of Mary Poppins that's where I went (laughs) to (laughs) (laughs) so I feel like it's one of those beautiful things and I think what was quite nice is when we've been both like when we in university we both studied like creative fields so growing up with like these artists and learning about them Mm -hmm. Seeing a visual aspect of Van Gogh chopping off his, his ears because he couldn't get them right, like that level of perfection that goes into it, and I think that's kind of showing in the in this clip that his inspiration is he wants to perfect it, he wants to get to that high level, and it's kind of like a goal. That's how I see it within this bit that he's just got that too, ambition. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. So in, in that, just a little bit, what did you guys think of Martin Scorsese playing Van Gogh? Yeah, it was a little weird. <laughs> Yeah, kind of interesting, but and I think it's because he looked too much like Martin Scorsese. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, he did all right. Yeah, I think it's again that more it's like it being a cameo, just because like mm-hmm. oh, I really like your work, so can I please be <laughs> in, in your thing? I think if I had watched this in the '90s when this came out, I think it would have bothered me less. But because we are hmm. watching this in the very far future, and I have yeah. that man's face so well embedded into my psyche. <laughs> It was a little hard to see him as Van Gogh. What about you, Sophie? Did you like him as Van Gogh? I I really can't judge, really, to be fair. I Mm -hmm. think I haven't seen many representations of Van Gogh, actually, Mm -hmm. to be able to compare. So I feel like, for me, I'm a bit of a neutral ground. It's Mm -hmm. it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. I kind of would have, like, if I was to rework the scene, I might have considered, like, maybe making Van Gogh in his own art style, because he did so many self portrayals throughout mm-hmm. the years that like mm-hmm. maybe just having one actual human and the rest cgi i mean i know it's the 90s that would have been really freaking hard but like yeah yeah it, it was a little hard to like pull yourself out of like oh teehee look who it is <laughs> <laughs> well i do know the reason scorsese was and it is because he met kurosawa when he was promoting film preservation which there's like three or four volumes on the criterion collection of that now mm-hmm. and it Kurosawa liked his fast-paced speech, and that's why he thought he would be best for Van Gogh. Just Kurosawa that, would have uh, loved YouTubers, but but that like man, that manic talking method of just like it, no, it's a it's very rambly, and it's not how I would have imagined Van Gogh at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I, I it does it does make me wonder a little bit because there's another movie that does it doesn't do Van Gogh a hundred percent, but it does sure. an impressionist style. Have you guys seen the movie What uh, What Dreams May Come? Mm. No, I don't think I have. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a mo- It's it, it's a depressing movie. Yeah. Well, it's Van Gogh. So. <laughs> well, it's not Van Gogh. It's Robin Williams. That's worse. And he he dies in a car wreck. No. And is going through like the afterlife, meeting pe- people, going back through his life, and there's a part where he's walking through a painting, but it does a much better job because he's like sloshing through the paint, not. Yeah. walking over the paint so i wonder if like this inspired that a little bit oh probably i mean depressive people inspire each other i think yeah 
That does sound vaguely familiar. Maybe I've just read about that film, but uh, I don't think I've ever seen it. But uh, yeah, that might have been yeah similar kind of vein, really. Yeah, I, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's definitely one of Robin Williams' different roles from his mm. comedy. If you want something different, break my heart all over again. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I get why Dreams is where it's at in this pacing. Is we've had we had two child stories, we had two really depressing stories, and now you need a little bit of lightness to like really to get back into the depression. Yeah, that's yeah. a good plan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the next one, yeah, the other one two are were... the next yeah. one's real rough. <laughs> yeah uh dream six mount fuji in red which is a doomsday scenario about the mountain erupting and six reactors going critical i do feel like this is one that for kurosawa is maybe a little less like i don't want to say not creative because it is creative but in it it is a more clearly inspired by other films then I think he needs, like, because normally you can see where, but, like, not necessarily, like, fully pull from. And I think this one has, there's so many doomsday nuclear reactor movies that definitely influenced him here that I think they're much easier to see. And while it's really good, for me, this one didn't feel quite as firmly Kurosawa's work as some of the other pieces in this film. Well, yeah. That might be because the close-up of the panic was his homage to Ishiro Honda, who yeah. <laughs> I guess was a directorial consultant to Kurosawa for from like his night since 1980 with Kage Musha. So no, I feel like I feel like with Kurosawa, that's just a nice way of saying like you know friendly coworker because mm-hmm. like he definitely is one of those people who, if he's interested in something, he has clearly no problem reaching out and like asking you to help or work out on something. And I do think this piece has the most outside inspiration on it Uh yeah well i also think i think i think kurosawa had had a lot of time to learn because this isn't his first anti-nuclear war movie there so godzilla as we all know is like the poster child for anti-nuclear war anti-nuclear yeah all hail the lizard king but kurosawa (laughs) made a 1955 movie called i live in fear and I felt he he did in 20 minutes yeah, what he like, couldn't do in 55. No, I agree. I think this is a much more concise storytelling of the fear of nuclear stuff. And I think a lot of that is because he has not only his own work to go off of, but like he's definitely inspired by some of the German and Russian like films here that have that dealt with the early fear of nuclear fallout. There's a lot of other Japanese directors who I, I think I can see pretty clearly some of the inspirations of like having the shielding of like the family, the sky color changing, but like it's, it's done with his own twist, which I like, but it it's definitely the one that like, I at least have the easiest time seeing the other inspirations. Well, I wonder and if you guys think this too is maybe it's because we are still closer to that era. I mean, we saw I mean, Fukushima, we've seen three mile Island. We've had multiple reactor meltdowns problems. in our lifetime. Sure. And I think right. it's something that like, Unlike with a lot of the war stuff that he he puts into his films, I think this one's easier for like a worldwide audience to like fully connect and see our own works in. And I think that's where I see a lot of the inspirations from, especially because like there's definitely some shots in here that feel much more on like other directors stylings, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it goes back to kind of the Van Gogh like inspiration that he just talked about, about how Mm -hmm. he's inspired by others. But it, for me, this one was definitely the easiest to see, like, oh, this is from that other movie that I watched last year. Or, like, oh, the coloring here makes so much sense. It look, it reminds me of much a lot of, like, this Italian film that covered the same topic. I don't know it. I, cannot, I could not find half of the names because, honestly, it's a lot of little pieces, which mm. is very Kurosawa style, right? Like, he never, like, fully just, like, has a shot that's someone else unless he's being very deliberate. But I think this one was just easier to see, for me anyway. Okay. So, what were your uh, initial, or what what are you, what are your guys' opinions of Mount Fuji and Red? Yeah, like I say, like there's definitely an influence of that. Like I say, we mentioned about um, Shir Honda. Like the, um, you, this wouldn't go amiss in some like you know, like disaster monster mm-hmm. movie kind of thing, like you know explosions and, and that, like you know the a, 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 a town city in panic of like a, a foreboding thing uh, coming ahead to them. And um, 
yeah, and then it kind of another thing that feels like quite short, but it's kind of like it. It's basically the message of like, yeah, or like, oh, like, what have we done? Kind of thing, like with you know a, a nuclear power plant melting down. Like, we shouldn't have been the ones to do this because if we didn't realize like how badly this would affect that, you know, that they they told they told us that that the, the, the this power was going to be the one to to mm. to, to maybe like you know help us out in the future but it's actually turned against us again it's like man meddling with science and it's gone horribly wrong basically and then now this the the fact that these these different levels of radio or different types of radiation and the colorized so that it's almost like so you so you know that, that it's there kind of thing as opposed to saying you're like when oh it's global warming but you can't like actually see it so it's mm-hmm. like oh is it just a myth kind of thing or that kind of spiel but I think it goes like a bit of a 360 to back to the peach trees. So mm-hmm. it's kind of showing what we're doing with the world, how we're putting all these bad chemicals in and eventually we'll have to move to space because it'll be better <laughs> than living on Earth because we're just ruining the planet. And I think that kind of then links in with the next dream sequence mm-hmm. where it is showing actually how you should respect nature and cherish the land that you're on and and love it but i think instead what we do is oh we want all these comfort warm we want everything given to us on a plate that's literally what a human is now we're quite lazy aren't we and i think that's kind of showing that retrospect in there Mm -hmm. i do think it tries it tries to make it a little bit light-hearted in the end when there is the guy wafting bless him the red (laughs) as if like like, shoo shoo go away smoke and you kind of feel like you understand a little bit of like, well, actually, you're either going to suffer and then die or you can actually, sadly, end your life here and just jump off the cliff now and get it over and done with. And it's that hard reality, isn't it, that kind of hits at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and maybe in a little bit more lighthearted manner, we just had an episode come out on Palm Poco where yeah. we kind of have that little bit with mm-hmm. the Tanuki mm-hmm. where they fight back and it's either adapt and make it by or... Go back and hope. Or the ones that just go off and drown in the sea. Yeah. It, I mean, mm. granted, a much more lighthearted version. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I, I do think this one sets up for the next one, I think, the best throughout this whole film. I think even though they yeah. are two separate stories and they cover two separate topics in a way, I think this helps set up the idea of like, okay, you've thought of the everyman's plight and struggle with this one of like, most people don't have any way of protecting themselves from something this big like Mm -hmm. a a disaster this gigantic yeah so like what are what really are your options other than to just throw yourself into the sea sort of mindset versus the next one where we we talk about people who like maybe they do have some resources and like what sort of like horror does that produce yeah well i think it's an interesting topic too because 35 years after his last nuclear movie Mm -hmm. he's still having those fears and anxiety and oh sure i mean like especially it it makes sense especially for kurosawa right like he he definitely is someone who reminisces very Mm -hmm. well and i think this is a great like example of like how even though he's already covered this topic honestly pretty thoroughly and pretty completely he still has like some different ideas they've changed a little bit throughout time Mm -hmm. because i mean godzilla is definitely a much different interpretation of like the horrors of radiation and nuclear nuclear like war in a way (laughs) or nuclear use yeah i mean we we can we can see that too with so i recently finished the hesse era godzilla films Mm, a beautiful representation well and it still also deals with pollution too specifically Uh godzilla versus space godzilla where it's about us polluting space at this point and that's Uh, what ends up that combined with Biolante's cells create a space Godzilla that comes back to destroy her. Space Godzilla would love Starlink. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it is an interesting way to transition from the lighthearted tone of the mm-hmm. crows to and now we're going to the seventh dream, weeping the weeping demon. Yeah. Which yeah, I, I liked this one a lot. I'm not going to lie. I did too. And here I, I liked it because I saw it as this post apocalyptic back to the old ways. Mm-hmm. And it's not just like the nuclear variations of the disaster, but they're also talking about chemicals being dumped, 
I mean, we mm-hmm. see that one in one of the more famous stories is the uh, Dancing Cats of Minamata, which was severe mercury poisoning mm-hmm. because a company was dumping chemicals into the ocean and, and the I, cats were eating the fish and getting poisoned with that. And you see that with other Godzilla movies. Uh, most of the Godzilla movies. <laughs> not, no, not all of them. Some, <laughs> some of them deal with like gene splicing and a bunch of other stuff. But sure. specifically like the end of the Showa era Godzilla films, you have 1971's Godzilla vs. Hedorah, which yeah. was released in the U.S. as Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Yeah, we don't we don't want to call him Smog Monster anymore. That's not a good look. But, but no, I I think the other reason I like this one is I think this one out of all of them is the the one that at least personally like I can see the ties in our own like news stories still like the like waste dumping and pollution is yeah. still something that like gets brought up on like the normal level news. It's not even like oh you know overseas they're having this problem. Like, no, my own neighborhood, my own backyard has like news stories about this sort of stuff so i felt like Mm -hmm. this was the easiest one to have like that direct connection Mm -hmm. that i do think like even though kurosawa wasn't necessarily making this movie for you to have that feeling it's more of like a reflection from him i do think that like that's the sense that he had for the rest of the film right because he had all of those connections and so it was easiest to get into his like understanding with this one i think okay well what, what did you guys think of the weeping demon well, like similarly, you said like how it's again another a tale of like um, how th- things have um, you know with the previous film like oh with the nuclear radiation and everything and that's kind of this kind of being like the fallout af- the aftermath of the situation and and with that being um, like you said like oh how things have getting gotten like oh just tipping things away and getting rid of it just just to make a profit basically on that and then again it's like as you you've been punished for that almost really again this is like a sobering lesson not to do such things but again that again that's something that's to, like it's a chris about how that still goes on today almost like people like companies will do like they'll just anything to to make a profit on anything they'll yeah, they'll do whatever they can to to to, to get that to get it's the like money. It's like a mass produce, yeah. isn't it? And then yeah. you've got a waste yeah. kind of mm-hmm. element. Right. I think what I quite like about this is still like a food chain. And so if you've got one horn, you are like the lowest the class class ranking of things. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's a like the folklore element comes back to that with like the demons basically, and they get like you know, almost like it's, it almost feels like they're in hell. Basically, mm-hmm. these people, these these creatures, and now what they are now, the demons. Yeah, um, and the, 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 the like eternal suffering, yeah, 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 suffering for that. You still almost. have the nature element as well. Yeah, and I think it feels almost like a return to the first two stories, and like it feels almost like a cautionary tale as opposed to more of like mm-hmm. a life reflection from Kurosawa too, which I really mm-hmm. liked a lot. Mm-hmm. It felt more like an, a a more adult fairy tale as opposed to his mm-hmm. like first two fairyish tales. Mm-hmm. I think the demon was even likable in this as well. Like, I actually quite liked the demon, which sounds really strange coming out of my mouth. Um, but he was a really kind of nice character. He was just being informative. Like, he wasn't actually feeling like he was a threat to him at any point. And I really liked the way that we saw the dandelions. Like, straight away, I clocked it's a dandelion. I know. Like, if there's a dandelion in my garden, I want to kill it and I want to get my <laughs> weed and it's gone. But actually, the dandelion shows like a form of hope in this mm-hmm. instance, where like it's the only thing that's growing, and actually, mm-hmm. a dandelion does a lot of good mm-hmm. um, to your soil and helps you actually reproduce mm-hmm. other things. But he does pick the rose straight away out of the ground, which then is like counterproductive. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. don't do that. Again. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hardest to grow out of the ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's almost like the demons kind of like. Yeah, it's speaking to him is like a, like don't make the mistakes I did kind of thing, and mm-hmm. like and then it's the like, at the end he's kind of like chasing him down the mountain because like he's t- oh I'm gonna the the pain's coming through for me now like go go like go escape while you still can kind of thing I think that was how I took that really mm. one. Well, and I think it's interesting because it's a very it's a more poetic way of going about that man is really the bad guy or the enemy Mm -hmm. because all Mm -hmm. the demons were human at one point or another. Yeah. 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 But, and I, they have a good tying of the last episode too, where 
there's the different color smokes blowing through Mm -hmm. that's that heavily ties us into more of a continuation of the last chapter than any of the previous ones yeah and and honestly the dandelion the more you think about it the dandelions work so well too in providing that little bit of hope not just because hey it's something growing but humans can eat every part of the dandelion you can do Mm -hmm. you can use the roots you can use the stalks you can use the flowers up until they actually like sprout but the or... last dandelion what it must be the last one of the whole season what are you talking about you haven't seen ice age and it hurts my soul <laughs> i've seen ice age it's just been a long time that's the best it... line in the whole movie all four of them or five however many we're up to now <laughs> uh, well also yeah what was it the there there's a tie to oh it's uh I, ice age is just uh god not tokyo godfathers the three godfathers it is the three godfathers retelling just with a very strangely drawn cat who's way too well looking for his own good and then a very (laughs) sad elephant (laughs) uh but yeah no i I think the weeping demon is like 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 we talked about this last few segments are very Mm -hmm. well put together because even though it, it is again, it's left up to your interpretation of whether I gets eaten or not. Mm-hmm. I personally think I, I personally hope he got away, but I mean, I think that's the whole idea, though. That's what makes it feel more mm-hmm. like a classic tale than I think his previous like two yeah. tales in this is that there is more of an ambiguity and hope because even the last one, like it's much easier to fall into the like despair of like, well, it's going to kill everyone. Even though he's trying to like fan the the smoke away, yeah. this one like is a much more ambiguous, and I think that's what makes it feel more fairy tale like. Yeah. Well, and maybe to your guys' point previously is that there's that continuation where we've seen this version of I since Cro- the crows. Mm-hmm. So this is our third episode with that character. Yeah, it definitely feels a yeah. little more rounded in a way. Because I'm wondering now on the reflection of how some of these or majority of them sort of end in a way that's kind of like not necessarily abruptly but they kind of like or like wet like from the very first like what, what happened to him when he would did he get to the end of the rainbow it's almost like when you wake from a dream isn't it it's like well oh you're waking up at that point like i, I don't what how trying to re-remember mm-hmm. like what even occurred really or like what is the ending because you, you you've woken up at that point and that's logically where the, the, it stops basically for you because you've you, you've you've not got the the capacity to continue with it because mm-hmm. you were now awake um so like when there's the ways like run down them tumbling down the mountain at the end he could have essentially woken up and that's like a oh oh my god right okay maybe i shouldn't like you should change my ways kind of thing you know, like like somebody mm-hmm. might do and if they had some of the bad dream of, of that to reflect something like that perhaps no i, I can definitely see that because I mean, this is the this is kind of the end of like the heavier parts of the series too, and that's what I appreciate with dreams is that the last dream, the dream of the water mills or the village of water mills, is mm-hmm. very much that kind of hopeful where I feel the story had split at a, at that part where it could have ended up or after dreams it could have continued in the nuclear path, or it could have been this kind of return to nature that was inspired mm-hmm. by kurosawa's father hometown of akita mm-hmm. back, back mm-hmm. before it got really developed because I, I did a little google map yeah. drop in of akita now and it's a lot it's a lot more developed than i than uh, this village sure mm-hmm. so, so what did you guys think of this portion the village of water mills this on reflection on the second time watch this is my favorite section mm-hmm. and that's that's that might sound stupid with the fact that this is probably the most realistic Mm. one of the dreams well but i don't know if that makes keeps it more grounded in in a sense but it the fact that it i think it just visually stunning like it at the same time it, you couldn't necessarily believe that such a place could exist but it could at the same time like the, the amount of water mills that there were and it was a little almost like a community that just just ran off that basically almost like you, you were something like a like a video game almost like it's just like this fantasy Mm-hmm. world but at, at the same time still feels like it is very real really mm-hmm. and it's like idyllic and everything almost like in a ghibli film or something perhaps yeah i think it's come back to the like kind of an inner peace like with nature with his surroundings i feel like for me it's you know like 
if you kind of look at your life where initially when you're like innocent you're naive you're quite young then you kind of become a bit more worldly there is a stage where you become a bit sinister and you've learned (laughs) how bad life is and you get a little bit like oh well down and out about situations and I think this is when you kind of retire that that's how I kind of into the countryside basically or something like that that yeah like you just want to be live life hard and fast when you're in your teens and everything and then but as you get older and older it's like oh I just want to settle down now and like somewhere quiet and you kind of almost like even like for me it's like oh why like with my parents were like, why are we living out in like the middle of nowhere? Real well, my friends are in like the the, the, the town centre and everything like that. But and then you then, got a house in the middle yeah, of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's like no, actually, I understand now. I, I totally understand. Yeah, everyone <laughs> becomes sense. an age where they think about turning to beekeeping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah, I I realized quite early on that I'd be happier as a gardener, not living on a farm. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. Well, what I think about this one is interesting, too, is that, yeah, we have that return to kind of the simpler time, but this also ties back into the older parts of the, or the first parts of the movie Mm -hmm. that are set in older times. Yeah, more traditional. More traditional, but this one is how we talked about kind of losing the meaning of tradition as, or traditions evolving, because the tradition in this one is he arrives at this village where they're having a festival for someone who died that no one remembers who they are anymore. It's just a festival that they have Mm -hmm. now. And I think we see that a little bit because it's also that romanticization of like when Americans go to Europe, we and we go to the countryside, we expect it to be a certain way, like very how BBC, yeah, how it's depicted in the movies. Like, mm-hmm. there's a mm-hmm. even on the opposite side, there's the romanticization of urban life and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And once you actually go mm-hmm. and live in the country, it's it's a lot different than sure, yeah. No, I think a lot of people have like a fantasy of slowing down and living a quiet, you know, less busy, less technology based life. And I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad fantasy because there's a lot of good that can come from that a lot of people do find new hobbies and enjoy in things like nature and gardening or keeping of animals or pets i do think this one though the thing that like it starts off as a bit of like a appreciation of nature and then this one kind of like turns into also like a kind of like kurosawa's coming to terms with the idea of death Mm-hmm. and it, it, like even two different versions of death death suddenly of someone young versus death of someone who's old and lived a full life and like him almost coming to peace with either option as opposed to like having a fear of dying young or yeah the death of the forgotten to the point where they're celebrating these people that no one remembers who they were or why we're celebrating this anyways yeah it feels a bit like kurosawa's fighting against the idea of like oh well when you die no one will remember you except for like the few friends and then when they go who who will remember you and he's like well somebody will I, they might not know who i was or anything but someone will remember that something happened yeah it it's a weird position of like i don't know if you're familiar with the term of like the second death where it's the mm-hmm. last time someone remembers you or someone mentions mm-hmm. your name that's your second death sure whereas yeah. this, this one is kind of that dream that we all live immortally even if someone doesn't remember our name yeah like there's still a celebration that for the past and you are the past now which i i really liked it because i think it it tied nicely with the like the comparison between some like celebrating someone who had passed away from like having a great long life and like that celebration of that person in contrast with the tradition of this like the celebration of like of just past in general and that like remembrance of like people before you Hmm. i thought they balanced very well especially for someone who throughout the rest of this movie had like dealt with a lot of clearly like pain and uncertainty in death and this felt like a nice like conclusion to like having lived through all that and especially like the returning back to like returning back to nature i think is the biggest part of this movie is Mm -hmm. Or this this ending segment is because as we wrap up, it cuts back to the river, and that's all our sound. That's all our music is the river while the credits roll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, just like that. It does make you need to pee. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, just like an idyllic kind of thing, like just the tranquility of it, really, and just like so, like soaking it in, essentially, of what you've kind of just seen mm-hmm. and witnessed, and the fact that the, our character I just kind of walks off and like, or was he taken away from that? The fact that is he like again like maybe 
going for the sense of like he's yeah he's happy to pass on or kind of like yeah just to reflect on just like uh, enjoy your life because I think the the whole the old man in the village like he's like oh, it's it's fun being alive kind of thing like so <laughs> a good little thing to end on really mm-hmm. like that thing mm-hmm. like to celebrate the fact that we are we are so lucky to be alive really and there's so much to appreciate for as long as you possibly can obviously but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely a celebration of life and yeah. I think it shows that you can be remembered and what you do even if it's just that your impact on a person helps going forward that actually any little bit matters and I think this is where you realize your decisions and everything you've gone through really impacts a massive picture and you are valued Mm -hmm. and I think it's just a nice way to end it as a conclusion of death is possibly the end but it doesn't mean that you can't have a lovely time until that happens Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it's also this idea this idea that even after death life continues on I mean we get our actually our last episode that's uh, at time of recording this mm. drops on Wednesday. We talk about that quite a bit in the tale of the bamboo cutter, which mm-hmm. was adapted into the tale of Princess Ka- the tale of the Princess Kaguya. Gotta have that the in there. Where where it's <laughs> that regardless of what happens, life goes on. And yeah, I think that's even important when we look back at the crying demons mm-hmm. arc too, where where we left off on Mount Fuji and Red, it felt hopeless. But then we get the that life continues. Maybe it not it might not be great for a long time, but sure. it's still going to continue even past humans. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's hope at the end. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, and I know Paul, you've said this is your favorite part of this. So, mm-hmm. what what is your favorite segment of dreams? <laughs> I'd say it's the beginning, and I know that sounds really strange, but I really like the idea of like an old wives' tale of if you touch this hot fire, <laughs> you'll get burned. And it's kind of making you learn your morals and your lessons from a young age. And I think it really has that fantasy dream feel mm-hmm. for, for me. Chris, what about you? Do you have a favorite segment? Oh, yeah, I think for me, there was the Weeping Demons segment. It felt like a return to like old folk tales and like more adult fairy tale styling. And I really liked the ambiguous ending. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'm, as much as I love the visuals of the first part of the Fox wedding, I, I don't know, I'm I'm a little bit torn between that and the village of the watermills just because I like how it ends and really wraps mm-hmm. up everything. But for that one to have any, that big of meaning, you have to go through every other part before it. Sure. And I like the cyclical idea that even though traditions are or reasons for traditions are forgotten you still continue and you do it just because it kind of reminds me of the mentality of shintoism where you might not believe that there's gods but you still do it because it's tradition sure and that's why shintoism is so hard i think for us westerners to pin down because everything with catholicism and christianity there's a reason why we do everything we do yeah there's more it's much less idealized and much more symbolic yeah and i, th- I think I, th- I think for me though it is what's going to put it ahead of me is the visuals of the village of the watermills i think that's probably mm-hmm. why that hands on mm-hmm. lands on my favorite is because it is that return to a simplistic lifestyle that we all dream for and it just has that i get at this point in my life a more in-depth meaning because when i first watched dreams i probably would have said one of the first two chapters would have been my favorite sure yeah <laughs> And in that same vein, I, f- I forget where I heard this, but someone said that anthologies are only as strong as their weakest part. Mm. What do you t- what what do you think is the weakest part of dreams? Yeah, for me this time around, I think it is um, the the crows. For me, I don't think it stood out as as much really, other than the fact that it's it's he it was just inspired by the art, and that's all I really talk from it but anybody could do do that it wouldn't feel like there was as daft as it sounded that wasn't the most creative or didn't seem like it was like a an effective way of doing it i don't know there was just something about it this time that didn't strike me um even i think secondary might be the the, the length of how blizzard went on a little bit longer but maybe it's because i was watching with you and you were kind of feel, <laughs> feeling that a little bit more perhaps but it definitely was <laughs> so i don't know if that's sophie's least 
it is. Right. Thanks, thanks for for <laughs> siding with me in there. Yeah, it. I think it was just more the discomfort I felt from watching the blizzard scene. I think, I think I need to rewatch it and kind of interpretate it a little bit different. Whereas I was just seeing it as a that I really did think they were going to die. So actually, at the end, I was pleasantly surprised when that didn't happen. But I think it was just more the uncomfortable like situation of feeling cold, the, the lack of breath, and everything like that that just made it feel a bit more hard to watch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Compared to the first two being really dreamscapey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Chris, what about you? I have to agree, it's Blizzard. I think partially because of how the pacing of it just didn't quite manage to like fill in, I think. But also because I don't think it necessarily tied the... And I, I don't need a direct tie, but like it, it seemed to fail in bridging the, the gap in both age and also like plight for the main character I to like from the childhood to the tunnel Mm. and I I don't know if if it was removed and we went from just childhood to the tunnel if I necessarily would have been lost in anything that I experienced okay yeah I I can see that too Uh, I mean I I do like the idea that while it's more self-biographical it's also a reflection of the history of Japan mm-hmm. pre and post World War II, like right before the war. Mm-hmm. But I, I have to agree with Paul that I think on a, on a rewatch, as much as I love Van Gogh and I love, I love the idea of walking into the paintings. It makes me think of Frederick Kiesler's surrealist exhibition where yeah, he projected the it's, it's paintings cool. into our space. It, it felt lesser of them, but less tied to it because it was more fanciful than mm-hmm. tied to actual lore or anything and part of that uh-huh. too was well well i can see it as if we're talking about this in the history of japan and kurosawa's fears it's that era after world war ii when things have settled down and japan became prosperous in like the 60s mm-hmm. and they had their bubble economy when things were going well mm-hmm. but it just it doesn't have that same tie to the other segments that the other ones did i i would say like it, it yeah. is that one that stands out from the rest of the anthology it's not a horrible bit no but it's not the strongest of the eight yeah i can totally see that but a- as a whole what, what what are your guys's like thought thoughts on it having gone through it once again like instead of like in its individual parts does it work as a whole movie i guess i guess in certain ways i like i can looking back through it i think maybe if it didn't have the blizzard or the crows there'd be a sort of semi-structure really with how things go from like childhood to like then going to war almost and then then more like the aftermath of war and nuclear thing and and then and finally like the realization that like oh no everything's going to be okay in the end kind of thing i think if it was cut down for to um six segments and spaced out a bit more stretched out maybe that would have been the way to go but that's just maybe a personal preference for me in that sense I enjoyed it more than I anticipated, actually. Um, I think it more makes you interpret life. And I think I quite like the idea of visualising how other people's brains and minds work and how dreams can impact your everyday life and are quite important. And they're just your subconscious, really. Uh And I think actually looking at it from that perspective of trying to deep unpick and unravel because it does like you say one minute you're watching something and you're really immersed in it and then you're like oh that's done now right on to the next chapter yeah. and i think that's where you would get your rewatch value of wanting to go back to this and unpick it good i'm, I'm glad you liked it because i i was a little worried when we we're like yeah let's do dreams and it's like I, I i know the last anthology movie you are not a huge fan of so <laughs> What about you, Chris? I did like it. It's not my favorite anthology by any long stretch. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I wouldn't watch it again, but I don't know if I'm going to actively seek it out anytime soon to rewatch. It's fairly straightforward in its interpretations and meanings, which I like to an extent. It makes for an easier understanding of Kurosawa himself, but it doesn't necessarily leave a whole lot of room for, like, desire for me to, like, come back and, like, really dig through when I feel like he fairly well lays out kind of his ideas. And while it's good, and I do think I would like encourage others to watch it, uh, this one, I'm kind of glad you're the one who bought the DVD. (laughs) (laughs) I I bought this one because it was Kurosawa, just to begin with. I understand. I think that also has a say in it. 
I'm not a hu- I'm not as big a fan as Kurosawa as you are. Mm-hmm. And like while I do know quite a bit about him and I do like others of his films, I don't find him like I I don't find him so like he's not so high in my list of directors and writers and creators that I needed a deep dive into his life and psyche. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. And honestly, I don't think the ties to his real life helped out the movie as much as I would have hoped. No. But I I personally think that as an anthology, it's a relatively solid movie. It sticks with the theme of dreams, but it's definitely not the best. Like there was one I watched late last year called Manifesto that's Mm -hmm. all about just sections of different manifestos and i think that worked a lot better sure but i will say this one is more consistent uh instead of like something like abc's of death where directors just had free for all for whatever they wanted to do or Mm -hmm. like where the vhs series went like the first vhs Mm -hmm. i think is very good Mm -hmm. and structured but then it just kind of loses the plot of like you had that one overarching story that kind of tied the little stories at least theme in a theme together Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm but could, you could have you could have your exploration of it instead of like no, nothing's tied together anymore. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's I, I I think I think it works, but it's not the best anthology. No. So, in on our show, we have a good, bad, weird rating system where we we don't have a number system, so you can vote a movie good, weird, bad, any of those combinations. So, so what what would you rate this movie then, Paul and Sophie? <laughs> Um, I, I going by my letterbox score, I still say it's good, uh, if a little weird on <laughs> <laughs> some aspect, but that's maybe just a cultural thing. But if you go in with an open mind, really, and and even if you're interested in like a little bit of research after the fact, then maybe of that, then I mean, that's something I've got the, the Blu ray of it and just with the documentary and everything, but I've not dived into that i know that's like longer than the film itself yeah. so um yeah yeah so a lot of time dedicated to to actually sit down and watch that but i'd be very intrigued to go and go like learn more about it through that and go like oh, okay that that's why i did that or like mm-hmm. yeah from the information that's given there so i'll, um, I'll yeah. give you a heads up on that the commentary will give you more information the documentary on it is very much so just it's very artsy. Yeah, it's very artsy. Just shots yeah. of them doing their stuff, and then yeah. little inserts yeah. of sketches for the most part. Yeah, you have to very much imply okay. your own information from the documentary. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Thanks. <laughs> Saved you some time there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sophie? How do you rate so, this movie? I definitely agree with you, Paul. I think it is. It's got a good and a weird element. Um, I wouldn't really say there's anything bad like that. I would completely like, I'm never going to watch this ever again. Mm -hmm. I think it's got this simplistic version of itself. Like you can actually watch it without any kind of dialogue and you would understand somewhat what's going on. But at the same time, it's beautifully done. And I think that's the bit where it makes me keep wanting to see it again, which I would enjoy in, in watching it. I think the weird bit is just the way that you would interpret it or how it kind of abruptly stops or like you with the crows kind of mm-hmm. that whole different element where you're like one minute I'm somewhere normal the next minute I'm painting <laughs> but yeah I think overall really positive good Chris I think this is a good tiny weird for me as well it is very good there's only a few scenes that like really qualify it as weird for me and I think most of those just are because it's an artsy anthology film and Mm. that's kind of they all kind of fit a little bit into the weird segment just by definition I think but yeah it's a good movie and I definitely would recommend other people to watch it it's just not going on my top 10 list anytime soon (laughs) I completely agree with that portion I mean it's a good weird for me it's not my favorite Kurosawa flick not my favorite anthology but I think it is an interesting exploration of a single man's vision of fears for his country ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Cause you do see a little bit of that. in like there, there's another film called Mishima life in four parts that I don't think Spielberg directed, but he produced it. And it's about this Japanese revolutionary who tried to, he was very nationalistic and tried to start a coup Mm -hmm. and ended up committing Harakiri. As one with coups do. Yeah. But it's that, that kind of, 
it's that exploration of dreams because if you if you watch Mishima Life in Four Parts, there's these very dreamlike sequences about his writings that I think they did that better than like with this than compared to Dreams. But I think Dreams has that like ever like we've all said it has that little bit of weirdness inherent in the dreamscape, and I think the weirdness is the connecting of the dreams together mm. where it, it's interesting that it almost tells a tells a history of japan mm. more so than kurosawa's life per se yeah i can definitely see that yeah mm-hmm. without yeah. getting too pretentious yeah. with it either a little tiny yeah. bit pretentious a <laughs> little bit but not like super super no, we've super watched, pretentious we've watched more pretentious that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> so then would you guys recommend this movie to anyone or just recommend it in general yeah uh yeah in, in general uh, just, uh if you like something a bit more out of the ordinary with an anthology series um if, i would definitely say yeah give it a check out if you're interested in thoughts of um what akira kurosawa interpret interpret interprets dreams as then yeah um see like the mindset behind that really and um i did note down on my letterbox uh review i said like uh kind of makes me ponder on what eight dreams i would catalog into a series of films to highlight my vision <laughs> so i don't actually know what that would still would that would that would be in a way that that would because it's sort of something to ponder on like like if there was to encapsulate something of that what would what would those instances in my life be that would uh, be of meaning or like would make mm-hmm. for us a, a good story and it way but the, for the most part the, the the stories do kind of flow in a way that that are structured not like completely random as such mm-hmm. they just mm-hmm. they do they, they do work in some and they do have a message behind them i guess that's the important thing to take away sophie would you recommend it i i would i think i would definitely re- recommend it but i think would i recommend it to my family i think they would be quite more closed off and it would be a little bit more of a culture kind of thing where they wouldn't really respect respect it in that format i think my mum's really shut down if there's any subtitles mm-hmm. on a film so probably <laughs> wouldn't be recommending that but i think anyone who has a love of japan and the, the culture and anything quite artsy then i would definitely say it's something to watch chris do you recommend it i do recommend it but i think the people who will like it best are those who enjoy a light artsy film it you don't necessarily have to know everything about the Japanese cultural influences or even Kurosawa to like, I think, enjoy the movie, but it does help. Mm. So I can see how some people, maybe this wouldn't be like a top pick or like wouldn't really be interested, but it is something that's pretty easy to recommend. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm in a weird space of recommending it because I do think it is worth a watch. I a hundred percent do. But I don't know if I could easily recommend it to everyone like, oh, you have to go and see this movie. Mm-hmm. It, I think it is a very much so that niche audience of people who would want to mm-hmm. really watch this compared to some other even lighter anthologies. Because this sure. movie isn't, it starts off light, but then it gets quite heavy early on. So Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's an interesting movie just in general. And just especially mm-hmm. like as from a film standpoint of a film that kicked off a almost at that point dead director's career again like kind of gave him a second life you know yeah definitely fills the autobiography role for him yeah and a better way than i think a lot of Mm -hmm. biographical movies in general i I agree especially for kurosawa yeah so but paul sophie thank you all for being on the show if you guys want to plug your stuff yeah, thank you. I'm so, glad I've been on it. Over to you, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you do want to um, check out some of our episodes uh, where me and Sophie talk about movies, cool. some of that she has seen for the first time and ones that we're both seeing for the first time, then you can go find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts from. And then we are also on the social media platforms of Instagram, Twitter, threads and tiktok under the handle sp underscore film viewers i love your guys' show just really chill just mm-hmm. lo- i actually really enjoy the episodes that make sophie mad a little bit <laughs> 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 yeah so admittedly those are like my favorites because it's i know it's gonna get a lot of people uh, 
uh, either laughing or like <laughs> reacting at least from like, oh, I can't believe this. Thanks, Paul. You're just going to put me out to the universe that everyone just likes my opinion <laughs> on something they really love. And then I'm just going to like completely. A bad guy. Yeah. Be like, this is rubbish. <laughs> like, what you're on about? <laughs> yeah, no. You're not afraid to say what you feel. No. You? No, I'm not holding back anymore, am I? <laughs> and that's a great thing about it is you don't have to. I mean, no, I mean yeah. Nico's over here shitting on everyone from the '80s childhood <laughs> with his Sandlot review. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I really appreciate. It. Honestly, without you two, this the Folktober wouldn't be happening. We would probably have just kept doing our cycle our normal, of our normal spookies. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's been a very interesting topic to cover. I'm glad we could bring it back for the pregame this year. So maybe, maybe next year do uh, it's, a different genre, perhaps. It's... Maybe we'll see. <laughs> 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 but, anywho, this has been the good, the bad, the weird podcast. Thanks for listening. Peace. Thank you for stopping by this year town of the good, the bad, and the weird. We appreciate your listenership, and if you want more of our takes in your life, feel free to check us out on social media at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, or TGTBTW for short. As well, if we missed a fact, your favorite part of a movie, or just have a suggestion and want to reach out and say howdy, feel free to email us at TGTBTWpodcast at gmail.com. And feel free to join our Discord at The Good, The Bad, and The Weird Podcast, where we talk about movies, just share random banter here and there. And always check out our podcasters, streamers, or any other content creator we shout out in our episodes. We really appreciate it. And as always, thank you for listening. Peace.